interfaith youth forum, Future and Hope, Youth, Faith and Passion. On behalf of the organizer, Buddha's Light International, Young Adult Division, and our co-organizer, Greening Sacred Spaces, I'd like to welcome everyone to the prestigious event. Before we get started, we would like to acknowledge and extend our welcome to the following guests. Member of Parliament Streetsville, the Honorable Mr. Brad Butt. Councillor Ward 9 for the City of Mississauga, Ms. Pat Sato. <laughs> Executive Director of Greening Sacred Space, Ms. Lucy Cummings. And the Abbess of Fogwangshan Temple of Toronto, Venerable Yonku. In addition, we'd like to welcome our speakers, our participants, colleagues and friends from different faith and cultural backgrounds. Uh, we also have youth members from San Francisco Fogwangshan Sanbao Temple and San Kiat Te Youth from Malaysia. Now, although you can't really see them right now, they can definitely hear us. So on the count of three, I want, to give, I want everybody to give them a big round of applause and a big welcome. One, two, three. Again, you can't see them, but I promise they can hear you. Uh, we hope everyone will enjoy this day. Uh, my name is Andrew, and it's an extreme honor for me to be your MC today. I've been a volunteer and an active member of Fogwang Shan Temple since it opened in 1997. And it always gives me joy and faith towards the future when I see such a gathering of youths coming here and sharing their experiences. Now, to appreciate your presence, our organizers has placed a small gift on your chair. So uh, feel free to take that home with you. And uh, we also have a prayer room available. So for your spiritual need, if you need a prayer room during the event or after the event, please find one of our volunteers at the reception desk. And they'll be more than happy to help you out. Our event's going to begin with a welcome speech by the Abbess of Fogwangshan Temple of Toronto, Venerable Yong Ku. So please put your hands together and welcome Venerable Yong Ku. Thank you. 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 代表呃所有呃主办呃的呃朋友们，在这里欢迎呃我们所有的法师们呃所有的贵宾，还有今天的各宗教的青年代表。First of all, on behalf of the organizers as well as our co-organizer, Greening Secret Spaces, we would like to extend our warmest welcome to all of you, our dear participants today. 在这么美好的呃天气，那么呃今天下午。我们大家齐聚一堂，这一场聚会可以讲，我们已经期待了许久。So on this beautiful sunny day,、uh, it is an event which we have been looking forward to for the longest time. 今天的这场青年论坛，呃，希望借助呃大家聚在一起，然后呢，呃，进行对彼此不同的呃文化信仰的呃不同的故事的呃了解。Uh, so we hope that throughout this event today, the Interfaith Youth Forum will be able to establish better and uh, deeper mutual understanding of our differences, our own stories, and our individual backgrounds. 希望在大家呃建立一个情谊，呃建立一个呃沟通呃交流的平台之后，能够针对呃。佛光山的开山宗长星云大师给我们的一个方向，叫未来与希望。针对这方面，大家再多做一些探讨。And we sincerely hope that、uh, we cherish this opportunity today, as we establish a foundation for us to develop a bridge as well as a connection, as we work towards、uh, the ideals of our founder, Venerable Master Xingyun, as we focus on the theme of future and hope. 各位知道，谈到未来与希望啊，其实呃，我的心中第一个想到的，我们的未来，我们的希望，其实就是各位各位青年。So、uh, personally, I feel that if you ask me the future and hope, my the future for me is all of you, the youth that are present here today. 
。但是青年可以为未来与希望努力做一些什么事情呢？我相信这个议题必须要很踏实的回归到环保的议题。So when we、uh, look further and ask the questions, what can youth、uh, today contribute towards the future? This is a very important question that we need to ask and reflect, as well as pay our attention to. 希望呢，大家也通过今天的论坛，针对呃现在啊整个的地球气候的暖化，啊这种极端化的啊天气，啊各种的啊在地球上发生的环境上的问题，啊针对这方面，啊希望借助各位年轻人，你们在各个宗教的啊这种信仰的力量，啊你们的代表性，希望把今天探讨的环保的这些议题。带回去你的宗教里头，继续去推动。And as all of you are aware, as well as experienced, uh, the uh, dramatic climate changes and environmental issues that we are experienced with at the present time, it is our hope that uh, perhaps environmental protection is something that all youth can work towards as we、uh, learn about our differences. And we work together despite differences in our culture, religious backgrounds. That we hope that environmental protection is something that all youth can、uh, work towards and help contribute to in the future. This is our first time to hold such a seminar. I hope that the conclusion of today can be extended to the next time. We will look back to review our conclusion today. 呃，结论，我们去推动的结果，到了下一次，也许是明年，也许是多久？啊、呃，我们第二次再举办，我们第三次再举办，每一次举办，我们都要看回，呃，过去的一段时间，我们为环保这件事情推动了有多少的成果。So this is our very first、uh, interface you form, and we hope that、uh, all the discussions that will happen here today will be carried forward. Uh, as we may、uh, organize the future of the next、uh, interfaith youth forum, and、uh, every single forum that we're going to、uh, organize together, we hope that we can reflect in the past、uh, years. Also, where we can think about and recall what are the contributions we have done, what we have worked towards as we help towards the environment. Uh, well. 祝愿祝福，我们今天下午会有一个很愉快的呃谈话，愉快的讨论，啊、呃，同时也会有很具体的结论。And I wish all of you a very pleasant and、uh, rewarding experience this afternoon, and we also hope that there will be some concrete and、uh, empowering ideas、uh, that will come out of this forum this afternoon. 最后呢，我有一点小小的补充。呃，我要为今天的这个呃开幕的啊、呃、这个时间延后，在这里致上万分的抱歉。呃，我们在佛光山举办活动，非常不习惯呃这个时间这样的 delay 啊，因为呃我们从大师我们的老师那里学来的，呃是呃分秒不差，但是呢呃今天我听说是因为交通的关系啊、呃，那么有一些 bus 啊、呃、这个呃。好像时间上不能配合，啊，所以就呃也误耽误大家的时间，我们在这里啊致上呃万分的抱歉。And、uh, last but not least, I would like to、uh, deeply apologize for the delay in the start time of this afternoon's event.、Uh, I've heard that due to transportation issues,、uh, traffic,、uh, it was delayed. But、uh, as Fokongshan organizes activities,、uh, we are very punctual. This is a teaching from our founder. Um, from the very beginning, so time is precious, and it is our sincere apology that we have、uh, started this uh, event uh, due to the delay.、Uh, sorry about that. 不过我们呃记得今天这样一个小小的插曲，我们在时间上有了误差，但是我们做环保是不可以有时间的误差的，我们必须要奋起直追。So even though there is a time difference or delay in today's event, but、uh, in terms of Our future, as well as what we can do to contribute to our environment and our society, that、uh, cannot be delayed. So、uh, may we have a wonderful start as we、uh, embark on this interfaith youth forum. Ah, 在此同时呢，我要感谢啊，我们社区的
呃好朋友啊，就是一直支持我们呃关心我们的国会议员呃 Bob 先生啊，还有我们的市议员是 s a i t o 女士啊。那么一直对于呃佛光山佛光会啊所有呃推动的这些活动，他们都呃支持，而且呃能够参与，呃、所以呃再一次感谢我们呃贵宾，还有我们所有的朋友们的与会，祝福大家，谢谢大家。And once again, uh, our deepest、uh, gratitude to our longtime sponsors and supporters, our distinguished guests, uh, MP Mr. Brad Buck, as well as Councilor Patsy. Thank you, Venerable Yonku. Up next, we would like to invite Dr. Lucy Cummings, who is the Executive Director of Faith and the Common Good, Greening Sacred Spaces. They are the co-organizer of this event. Please welcome Dr. Lucy Cummings. So I'll just start out by expressing our deep thanks to Venerable Yong Ku and Venerable Jia Chen for helping us、uh, organize this amazing event. My name is Lucy Cummings. I'm the Executive Director of Faith in the Common Good Greening Sacred Spaces. We work with faith communities of all backgrounds、uh, to support them to be role models in their local neighborhoods. To help build greener, healthier, more resilient communities.、Um, in our work,、um, one of the questions that I'm asked the most is、um, about engaging young people.、Uh, there is such a strong feeling,、uh, especially when you're looking at the environment,、um, that we need our young people to take the lead.、Um, in our faith communities, especially.、Um, Uh, our, the leadership often、uh, comes to me to ask me about、uh, effective strategies for engagement. So I guess I wanted to start by saying that we need you. We need your ideas. We need your passion. And this, I think, we all err on the side of hiding behind our computers and connecting virtually. And this is really a phenomenal opportunity for us to. Meet with each other to build friendships, to build relationships,、um, because we're blessed to live in one of the most amazing multicultural cities in the world,、um, and、um, and we need you to、um, set the stage、uh, for how to build、uh, greener, healthier, more just societies. So.、Um, The, I, I will end by saying、um, I'm excited about today.、Uh, we、uh, have, have been、uh, again blessed to work with the Fo Guang Chang Temple and Buddhist Light International Association to put this uh, uh, activity together. But now it's time for us to step back and sit down and give you the the reins. So.、Um, Um, I'm very excited, and thank you all for taking the time to come out and take the lead on this. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lucy Cummings. Next, we would like to invite the Honorable MP Brad, Mr. Brad Butt, Member of Parliament of Streetsville. Well, thank you very much, Merci beaucoup. Good afternoon, everyone. Bonsoir, bon après-midi à tous. It's wonderful to see you all here today, and how inspiring it is to see young people engaging in this important forum today, and and this important conversation that we have to continue to have in this great country of Canada as to how we make our country even better, how we continue to care more for one another, to keep Canada being the greatest country. Uh, in the world, when I look back at my involvement prior to getting involved in politics, I started just like you. I got involved as a young person in the city of Mississauga. I was a founding chair of the Mayor's Youth Advisory Committee back in 1982. It seems like forever ago, but that's what inspired me. I got involved just like you as a young person that cared about my community, wanted to see my city, my community, and my country be a better place. 
uh, to live. So I want to congratulate each and every one of you for taking time out of what could be a beautiful day. You could be outside doing so many wonderful things and enjoying the weather, but you are here today. And you are here today because you are the leaders that will build uh, this country in the future. I want to also uh, welcome our friends that are joining us on video from outside of Canada. And to say we wish you, you have uh, great Canadian uh, wishes from us. And thank you for participating in this as well. You know, this is an interfaith uh, forum. And there is, there is one thing that li links all faiths, uh, all religions, regardless of to which God you pray to or which belief you have, and that is every single faith is linked by the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Every single religion holds that as a key principle in what they believe in. And so you are all here today, regardless of your faith and background, you are all here today because of that great link and I want to congratulate you again for doing that. This is the first opportunity I've had venerable since the uh, Lunar New Year celebrations to uh, come back and visit and I want to present you with a, um, a framed statement that I made in the House of Commons paying tribute to Fo Guan Shan Temple and I want to read it to you and then present this uh, to you as well. And it reads, Mr. Speaker, Last night, I helped ring in the Lunar New Year, the Year of the Sheep, at Fo Guan Shan Temple, located in my riding of Mississauga Streetsville. The objectives of Fo Guan Shan Temple are to promote the principles of humanistic Buddhism and to foster peace and harmony among all peoples of the world. Venerable Master Sin Yun, the founder of Fo Guan Shan, has guided this effort by providing educational opportunities, sponsoring cultural events, engaging in community service, and extensively writing and teaching about the Buddhist path of wisdom and compassion. This beautiful temple, located on Mill Creek Drive, is a wonderful asset to our community, and the work of Buddhist Light International Association members is both locally and world-renowned. The Year of the Sheep symbolizes peace and generosity and reminds us to be well-grounded and kind to others. May I wish everyone a very happy new year. Gong he fa choi, gong si fa chai, chok mong na mwa, sai buk mani. That is you? Is that close? Anyway, that was my statement I made in the House of Commons on Thursday, February the 19th, and to pay tribute to this wonderful, uh, wonderful temple. And Venerable, you always open your doors to the wider community. You should be so greatly congratulated for doing that and sharing the peace and love of this wonderful place to the great Mississauga community. So if you want to come up, I'd like to present this to you. I'll ask Councillor Sayo to come as well, because she's also in the picture of this, because we all attended the event, and we'll just present it, uh, we'll pre co-present it to you. Shea <laughs> Shea, have a good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Bradbutt. Our next guest is Ms. Pat Sado, the Councillor of Ward 9 for the City of Mississauga. Please welcome Ms. Sado. Thank you. I always hate following Brad, <laughs> particularly at a place of worship, because I, I said he really wanted to be a preacher in another life. <laughs> and he's so good at it, isn't he? He <laughs> really is. And I will get to follow him again tomorrow as, as we are um, joining our, uh, the other congregation up the street, the other large place of worship. Grace Cathedral is celebrating their 10th year. And oh, we have a member from Grace Cathedral. They're wonderful, wonderful. So we will be celebrating the 10th anniversary. Um, I want to recognize that, uh, that joining me today is, uh, is a young lady, Jessica Miles. Jessica, maybe you can just kind of wait here. I'm going to totally embarrass her. Um, 
Jessica is the president of the Mississauga City Youth Council. This is a group that was formed just over about a year ago, a little over a year ago, and um, they elect a young person from each of the wards in the city to serve on the youth council. And they are um, learning, they, they work with, um, with the member of council, hopefully. Je Jessica attends a lot of the events that I do, and, um, and hopefully I'm, I'm providing her with some mentorship. And she does the, the opposite to me. She helps to mentor me in issues of youth. So it has worked out very, very well, and I'm so pleased that she was able to join me today so that um, she could see what was happening with the forum. Uh, you know, yesterday, it's, it's interesting because yesterday I launched the um, Rebel 15, which is the 2015 Rebel Week event for young people in the city of Mississauga. And it's uh, co-sponsored by the city and various groups and by the, by the youth in, uh, in all of the schools, high schools in the city. And over the coming week, there will be over 300 events that are being sponsored and held for young people within the city of Mississauga. Some are arts, cultural events, there are sports events, uh, forums, workshops, um, musical events, just a, a wide array. And on Monday at Celebration Square, we're going to have over, th I think it's over 3,000 young people from high schools in Mississauga who will be singing on, uh, at Celebration Square. It's really, truly a celebration of youth within the city. So when I was invited to be here today, I thought, wow, what perfect timing, because we're, we're celebrating our youth in the city of Mississauga, and you are joining today as youth from various faiths to talk about, to network, to meet each other, to talk about your, your differences and your commonalities, and to see how you can work together to make your cities, your neighborhoods, and your world a much better place. And, you know, the, the abbess, I don't want to contradict her, but uh, she said, you are the future. And that is so true. Youth are the future. But youth are also the present. You, what you do today, what you discuss in this forum today, and what you take back to your communities, to your churches or your place of worship, and what you take back to your school and your neighborhoods and your families, that's something that you can be doing today in the present. Don't wait until you become an adult, until you have finished school, have, you know, out in the workforce. You don't have to wait. I realize that sometimes young people feel that they're not being heard just because they are young people. And it's up to those of us that are a little bit older than you. I'll stretch that a little bit. Uh, but it's up, it's up to those of us that are supposedly older and wiser. We're not always wiser. You know, our, our young people, we have so much wisdom and so much knowledge and so much passion in the youth of our communities today. So make sure that you make your voice heard. That is the most important thing if I could give you any advice. Brad, for example, um, you know, Brad, when he was a young man a few years ago, he made his voice heard as a youth. And, and when I first came on council uh, in 1991, Brad, I think you were still with the Marriage Youth Advisory Committee at that time. And uh, actually, before I came on council, I was on staff. And one of my roles was liaison with the Marriage Youth Advisory Committee. And I got to learn firsthand the incredible, incredible insight and work ethic and the ideas and the passion that the young people that served on that committee had and what a huge, huge difference they could make in their communities and in our city. And I think it's great testament that um, you know, look where Brad ended up. I don't know if you want to end up there, but, you know, no one, well, very few people. He wants to be in the Senate. He only wants to be in the Senate, okay. <laughs> very, very few people. There are a few people who grow up wanting to be politicians, you know, but the smart people don't want to grow up to be politicians. They just kind of end up there like some of us. But, um, but I, I do want to say I want to wish you a, a very wonderful forum. This is a great opportunity from, for you to listen to each other 
Interestingly enough, I'm hosting a forum, not a forum, just a gathering next Wednesday of the adult youth leaders in the Meadowvale community, in the Ward 9 community, and over 28 places of worship just in this one area are invited to, uh, to come and to network and to basically do what you're doing today is to learn more about each other's faith and then to go out and say, how can we work together? Because individually, yeah, we can do a little bit, but how can we all work together to make a difference in our community? So I'm hoping that after Wednesday night, some of the adults will take um, back out. But I, I guarantee you that there will be more action from this group today, from you young people, going back into your communities, that you are going to act a lot more and a lot faster and a lot more effectively than some of the adults are going to do next week. I hope I'm proven wrong, but I have to say that this is where the passion lies and this is where the action lies. So have a wonderful forum and I wish I could stay, but I can't, but uh, have a wonderful time and thank you again to all the organizers. You've done an excellent job, very, very worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pastato, and uh, all our guest speakers. We definitely appreciate you taking your time out of your schedules to be with us today. Uh, I want to start off the forum with a little ice-breaking game within the table that you're at. Um, the the ice-breaking game is called More Than One Story. Now, this is an award-winning card game designed to build bridges between people of all ages, backgrounds, and all cultures. Um, now, we would like to give a special thank to the Intercultural Dialogue Institute of GTA for their contribution in distributing and promoting this meaningful tool for interfaith dialogue today. So on your desk, you should see a deck of cards. Each card will have a story. Uh, the point of this game is uh, hand out the card here, uh, make sure everybody has a card. Uh, we're going to take about eight minutes. And the way this game works is that in your group, everyone will pick a card on the table. And on the back of the card, you will see a story or a situation. So I want everybody to take the next eight to 10 minutes to genuinely share your story with others in the group. Uh, it could be something funny, could have been something motivating, something inspiring. At the end of this eight minutes, we're gonna have one or two volunteer storytellers who will come up and share a story that they heard in a group. So uh, I'll let you guys get to it. Uh, it's a interactive event, so let's uh, yeah go go right ahead.
and my intercultural work in the Broad Ecumenical Church. So I just wanted to share that story and uh, I thank my group for the encouragement. Thank you very much for sharing your story. Now, due to time constraint, we only actually have time for one story. Um, but during the break, I'm sure you'll get a chance to interact with other youths and share the stories that you've heard today. Um, I think just by being in your little group, you can tell that we're all unique in our own ways. We have our own experience. We have different backgrounds, different cultures. And we can really appreciate the fact that someone else will have a different story and that life is just to learn from each other's experience and appreciate what we have. Hopefully this icebreaker will encourage us to have an open mind in today's interfaith event. The theme of our forum is future and hope, youth, faith and passion. We will first start off the forum with a very special keynote speech from a very special young man. We're very privileged to have with us today Mr. Steve Lee. Steve Lee is a 22-year-old University of Toronto student who at the age of 22 has already represented Canada at the 2009 G8 Summit in Rome, 2012 World Youth Congress in Rio de Janeiro, 2012 NATO Youth Summit in Brussels, 2013 United Nations Environmental Program Tunza Conference in Nairobi, amongst other events. He's been invited as a speaker and panelist to over a dozen of conferences. Today, Steve is giving us a speech on the importance of faith, journey of realizing his passion, and exploring the relationship between faith and results in humanistic action. Without further ado, it's my honor to welcome Mr. Steve Lee. Uh, in the West to dichotomize our faith uh, from our public life. 
we're, uh, we can practice our faith in private, but as soon as we start bringing it into the public, where we're in positions of influence to those around us, we have to take the hat off uh, of faith and blend in with the rest of the world. Our faith and the rest of our lives should not be dichotomized, but we often live out a schizophrenic faith. Uh, but this is actually a cultural phenomenon, particularly uh, to the West, of the world's 196 countries, 64 flags have a religious symbol on them, and 30 heads of state are required by law to belong to a certain faith. And also in 2010, 84% of the entire world's population, uh, which is about 7 billion people, self-identify with a particular faith tradition. So as a result, whether as a function of culture or conviction, faith can't help but influence uh, and impact every sphere of global life and every sector of our global economy. So according to the uh, World Economic Forum's Global Competitive Index, uh, there is a positive uh, relationship between religious freedom and 10 of the 12 pillars of global uh, competitiveness. So our faith really shapes uh, the lens through which we view and engage uh, the world. It directly shapes our mindset, our perspectives, and the very core of who we are. If we disconnect a part of us or alter who we are uh, because of political correctness, what we're actually saying is I value my sociocultural acceptance more than my faith. So it is my hope and prayer that today uh, we would end our private uh, faith and begin to practice our public faith. And what better place is there to do this than the Interfaith Youth Forum event? So I'm very happy uh, to share how my love for Jesus Christ shapes and propels me uh, into pursuing my passions. And my passion is to live out uh, the first and the greatest commandment that Jesus identified, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the second is love your neighbors. So this loosely translates into love God, love people, and live justly. So when I have recognized uh, my nature to reject and ignore the will of God, I realized my need for Jesus Christ. And that's when I gave my uh, life to Jesus and decided to follow and become more like him. So my old self had died with Christ on the cross, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ in me who lives. And it is every uh, mission that God has invested in every follower of Christ uh, to manifest uh, the character of God for everything that we do, uh, not only in our private life, but also in our public life. And that is really what compels me to pursue uh, systematic health care, uh, which is what I'm studying, uh, justice, and environmental protection. So a couple years ago, uh, I'm just being mindful of the time here. Uh, a couple years ago, I was in uh, Nairobi in Kenya, and uh, I, I was doing a conference. I did not expect to do anything else other than maybe go to a safari, and they have an amazing meat buffet where you can try out all kinds of exotic meat, like giraffe, snakes, crocodile, <laughs> ostrich. I was really looking forward to that. Uh, but after uh, the conference, I got connected over Facebook with someone that I didn't know. I thought she was part of the conference, but apparently not. And she said, hey, you know, I hear you're in Nairobi. Do you want to meet up? And I was like, I don't know you, but sure, why not? And uh, she showed me around uh, Nairobi, and that was good because I got to travel. And uh, I wasn't ripped off because you know, I'm not African, and they would always rip you off if you're a foreigner you know, uh, doing vacation. So. Uh, yeah, so it was great, and she said, hey, do you, uh, you want to come over to my mother's restaurant where she's a waitress, and you know, uh, we can have dinner, and then uh, we can go over to my house and you know, maybe talk and whatever. So I was like, yeah, sure. So I uh, followed along, and uh, we took about four different buses, and these buses were completely run down. None of the dials worked. The seats were ripped off. It's just steel frame. Uh, how the buses really run is uh, the driver would bump into the car in front of you, and that's when they know how to stop. And, yeah, the bus is, uh, it, it's, it's hard to call it a bus, but anyway, it moves and it transports people. So uh, we got to the restaurant, there's no light bulbs, nothing, it's literally a mud hut uh, with candles and a plastic table. And the mother came, and she was so gracious and really nice, and uh, she came in off. 
uh, offered me food, and uh, we were having an amazing conversation. And uh, my friend was talking about her life story, uh, of her background and her family and her parents. And it just broke my heart to hear all the hardships that she went through, particularly because during the ride, I was complaining about how hot the bus is and how difficult my life is, uh, which in comparison, it was nothing. And what she was saying is, um, well, she was showing me through some photo albums of her past, and um, she went through all stages. You know, when you have very uh, acute malnutrition, then your belly pops out. Um, but now she's very plump. Then she went back to that state, and now she's uh, you know, trying to lose weight. So she had ups and downs, and uh, she lost her father uh, for some reason, and uh, the stepfather uh, very badly abused her and her family, both physically and sexually, and now she's just living with her mother. And uh, the mother works incredibly hard. She goes out uh, in like 5, 6 a.m. in the morning and comes back uh, past midnight. I don't know how a person functions that way. And she walks uh, over two to three hours every day just to get to her workplace. And she does three jobs. Uh, I don't know how that even works. And yeah, so as we were eating, uh, my friend was telling me, you know, my uh, dream is to really uh, go outside of Kenya and make money where you know minimum wage is much higher and the currency uh, means more than uh, in Nairobi so that my mom can rest in her bed for at least one day and that's what she wanted so well wow, okay I have two minutes I'm gonna try <laughs> yeah so uh, what I, uh, yeah so details aside uh, we had a wonderful dinner and I went to her uh, place and uh, I had some uh, noodles with me uh, four packets, and I said, you know, I, I have some noodles, uh, why don't you have these noodles, and let's eat it for a snack for the kids, And because uh, there were a bunch of kids on that street, about 15, 16 kids, and, uh, well, they didn't have a burner or anything, so they cut up a uh, candle, and they just warmed up some water. Uh, we threw in the noodle, and while we were warming up the noodle, I was just playing with the kids, and uh, when the noodle was ready, uh, I asked, her, you know, out of my stupidity, hey, uh, do you want to eat this by ourselves or should we share it with the kids? And well, obviously we should share, but you know, I asked because I was hungry. And uh, her response was, Steve, I've never had uh, enough of anything in my life, but now I have roof over my head, walls around my house, and finally I have food that I can share with these kids. You know, I do want to share. So I was like, of course, of course we should share, you know, like bring the kids in. Uh, we ate the food, and there was 15, 16 kids and three adults. Uh, we had three packets, uh, left one for the mother. Uh, there was more noodle left than what we started with. Uh, if, if I knew there were pictures, I would show you the picture of, uh, of the beginning and the end. But uh, there was more noodle in the end than what was uh, there at the beginning. So uh, I truly believe it was a miracle. Uh, it took me a very long time to see if that was real or not. Um, but I truly believe that uh, an incident where uh, we really want to see um, and respond to the heart uh, of thanksgiving and the heart of uh, willing to share with the part of God's creation really moved him. And that's what uh, caused the miracle to happen. So, uh, yeah, uh, well, because I only have one minute, I can't really share all the other stuff that I was uh, preparing. Um, but yeah, I guess I will uh, end with one thing, and uh, that is the concept of justice um, is something that all of our generation shares. Uh, the climate change, we're the first generation, well, we're the last generation uh, to have the ability to end climate change, and we're the first generation to have the ability to uh, eradicate or eliminate extreme poverty. All of that can be done if the world stopped their military budget for five days. So it's not that we don't have the ability, uh, we just don't have the political will. I, can, uh, I, I brought some statistics to share uh, about the, uh, how terrible uh, the injustice in the world is, but that is what uh, the, the face of injustice and how terrible it is, is what propels me um, to see uh, not the uh, not the terribleness of just the injustice, but also uh, the grace and love of God that uh, that He 
shows through his people to the rest of creation. So uh, I do want to point out, lastly, uh, that I want to challenge uh, for you to reflect on how your faith transforms your life. Is it your desire for a certain outcome that uh, informs your faith life? Or is it your faith that shapes everything else in your life? How is your faith influencing the life of those around you? And how much power does your faith give you in your life to uplift the human personality of those around you? So continue, continuously question uh, your faith, as I do, and continuously question uh, the things and experiences uh, that you're going through. So because I believe that my God is worthy of all of my intellect to wrestle with. So bless you, and hopefully I'll be able to chime in a little later with you and so, have a good day. Thank you for that speech and sharing your story, Steve. Uh, I now like to hand over the next portion of this forum to Mr. Stephen Chan. Stephen's been a Fogwang, uh, been with the Fogwang Shan Temple of Toronto since it opened in 1997. He's been a member of Scouts Canada and the Young Adult Division, and has definitely represented the temple on several international conferences. So please welcome Mr. Stephen Chan. Thanks so much, Andrew. Hi, everybody. Welcome, and it's such an honor to have this opportunity to. Uh, facilitates a portion of uh, you know our forum today. Um, I'll be facilitating the first portion and at this time I would like to uh, introduce and invite our first panel panelists uh, up to the front. So perhaps when I call your name uh, you can uh, head on up and find your place in the front. So I would like to welcome Alexander O'Neill of the Buddhist City. Next, and to welcome Bosco Tan representing the Christian faith. Our Lord Gill, representing the Sikh faith. Next, uh, Hector Acero Ferrer, representing the Catholic faith. I'd like to also welcome Michaela Olofesco, the Catholic faith as well. And I'd like to welcome Rachel Rebe of the Judah Jewish faith. And Rafimi Yachty of the Catholic faith. Please, welcome to the front. I'd like to invite uh, Steve Lee, our keynote speaker, to be in the front as well, to be a part of our panel for today. Thank you. Please have a seat, everybody. So as we all know, the, the theme for our forum is Future of Hope, Youth, Faith, and Passion. And this first portion that we're going to be um, facilitating is going to invite uh, you know, various members of our panel to uh, reflect and share their, uh, you know, their, their experiences and their wisdom uh, with a few guiding questions. And I'll share that with you right now. Um, the first theme that we're going to explore is how um, the core elements of um, our panelists' faith has uh, influenced them. And followed by that, we're going to also look at how youth perspectives... Um, <laughs> Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, the youth perspective on positive values in our daily times. Uh, and our third theme will be how uh, we integrate uh, faith and passion into our lives. And so for the uh, first uh, theme, uh, we're going to have three of our panelists uh, get to speak with us. Um, it, they'll be going alphabetical order. So we're going to first have Alexander, followed by Bosco and Rahime. Um, each panelist is going to have uh, about five minutes to share their experiences and story with us. Once we have all of our panelists uh, share with us, I'm uh, going to try to uh, get some um, uh, uh, you know, dialogue, hopefully, uh, where our panelists saw parallels or intersections with what they were speaking about. And then finally, we'll open, up, uh, open it up to our floor uh, to invite a few questions uh, for, from you for our panelists. And so, for the first portion about sharing the core elements of their faith, uh, these were the questions that we provided our panelists. Can you share with us some core elements of your faith? How do you put your faith in practice in your own life? When was your faith in your own spiritual life the strongest? And I would like to first invite Alexander to speak to our audience. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Mm -hmm. Does it work? Does it work? Oh, I think it's better. 
Hello? Yes, great. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, as, uh, as mentioned, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, faith. Uh, but um, rather than sharing uh, particular experiences, I more or less uh, prepared to talk more about faith and, uh, as I see it as a Buddhist, but also uh, what my thoughts are on interfaith dialogue. Uh, but also on how that can lead to harmony and seeing common ground, and how that ties into the greater goals of religions, but also um, perhaps more pertinent to uh, greening sacred spaces to uh, environmentalism. So uh, the first, uh, the first thing that I'm going to talk about faith. Uh, now, for Buddhists, uh, particularly Western Buddhists who might have come from another religion, often faith is one of the first things that we have difficulty with. Often uh, we feel like faith is the one thing we want to get away from. The reason we go to Buddhism is because it's the religion that doesn't require any, any faith or any beliefs. Now, when you get to know Buddhism a bit more, you, you find that actually this isn't necessarily the case. That in fact, the first of the five how powers, the panchabala, uh, that the Buddha said were required for enlightenment is actually shraddha. Now shraddha means a clarity. And it's clarity from one particular thing, that's clarity from doubt. Uh, so in fact, this, this is actually the same thing as faith. Now, when discussing what shraddha really is in, in commentaries, one uh, Buddhist commentator, Asanga, said that uh, faith is certainty, knowing a fact to be true. But you, you know a fact to be true through experience, and gradually over time. Uh, now, I think there are some people, that are some who have this notion of the, the faith baller, so someone who, someone who has that road to, to use an interfaith uh, appropriate metaphor, has a, a road to Damascus uh, experience. But, uh, but I think for a lot of particularly Western Buddhists, it's a gradual experience. It's kind of like a, a peering around the corner out of curiosity at first, and you peer a little bit more and more, and then before you know it, you're in the middle of the room. And I, I feel like that's really what the faith experience is for a lot of uh, a lot of Buddhists. But when we reflect upon what this kind of firm knowledge, which builds up gradually through experience, through meditation and study and so forth, is uh, for a Buddhism in general, we find it's probably not too different from what you end up with faith being in different religions. There is, of course, that great, uh, that great uh, verse in the Bible, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and in the latter, uh, I might be uh, butchering the quote, and in the latter day when the worms eat my flesh, I know with my eyes I shall see God. I think that is the same kind of, you know, rock firm certainty that, that, is, that is the same in uh, Buddhism and other religions. Now, as, as regards interfaith uh, dialogue, one of the things that we might think as, as Buddhists or members of other religions is, is this really what we should be doing as good Buddhists or good Christians or good Muslims or what have you? Shouldn't we really be meditating or praying or studying? But actually, when we go and read, particularly with Buddhism, when we go and read the sutras, the Buddhist dialogues, the Buddhist uh, holy texts, we see what the Buddha was doing almost all the time was actually having interfaith dialogue. He was always talking to the giants and the Hindus and so forth. And if we have a look at other religions, uh, we'll see that, you know, for example, Sikhism, for instance, is almost entirely the product of interfaith dialogue. So interfaith dialogue is crucial uh, to uh, not only building religions but strengthening religions in the future. And as regards, and, and it's also important for harmony and seeing seeing common grounds. And what we need for religions, and to achieve the common goals of, or, that I think all religions have, we need to have this harmony between, between people. Building, as they say in the Bible, building Jerusalem on earth. Um, or realizing a Brahman with our eyes, as they would say in Hinduism, or uh, realizing the upright society founded on Li, as uh, Confucian would say, or as our master, our teacher, Master Xing Yun, always emphasizes, building the pure land on earth. And the pure land in Buddhism is this ideal, this <coughs> ideal world, which is perfect for practicing Dharma, the Buddhist, thank you, I'll, I'll just finish in a moment, <laughs> which is perfect for practicing 
uh, religion of Buddhism. And in, this, in these Pure Lands, you see, actually, you see the trees preaching the Dharma. You see the animals preaching the Dharma. And I was going to get into this a little bit more, but I think in a certain sense, what we're seeing here is actually a kind of environmentalism, that we can learn the truths of our religions from the nature. And, uh, and that, indeed, progress towards these goals is very important, uh, the, uh, founded upon the, uh, the impetus of youth. And as Master Shingyun, our teacher, always says, Buddhism depends upon the youths. It depends upon uh, the next generation, or, or this generation. Um, so, so thank you, that is uh, all I have to say. And I hope you have a, a, lovely, uh, a lovely day, a lovely panel, and uh, Buddha bless you. Thanks so much, Sandy. I really appreciate it, you know, the, the themes on the universality of, right, uh, human senses, as well as how, you know, faith, uh, you know, at the end of the day, might just boil down to that piece of that, you know, what do we know is true, but it has to be through experience, and of course, mature through time. So thank you for that piece. Uh, I would like to invite Bosco uh, to speak uh, on behalf of the panel. Uh, next. Thank you. Hello everyone, and thank you for inviting me. As someone who grew up in church, who absolutely hated church, and, and slept at, church was a good place for sleeping. But I really wanted to share what really is, how, how did I become a pastor? How did I become a, a missionary with a Christian intervarsity? And really just like faith completely, just everywhere, every aspect of my life. And that is what the Christian faith is for me. As, and for me as the universal, as the one, as the one truth of of all, and that's why I'm proclaiming what I, what I believe, right? I mean, when you look at the world and look at all the beauty of the world, when you stand on the mountaintops, when you look at the Niagara Falls, just a little bit further from here, a little bit, but and you see the majesty, you wonder, where did this come from? And for us as Christians, is there someone who created it? The Bible believes that this, the person who created the universe that we live in, and that the bodies we inhabit, is, is our creator God, so our, our father God. And so how, we can, how can we know this God? And it's only by looking at Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, is, when, we, when we talk about that, Christ isn't a last name. Christ, is, we didn't say like Jesus and then Christ. Jesus, Christ means, is a title that means God's chosen king. And when we proclaim it, when we proclaim the gospel, the good news, uh, you've heard that term before maybe, it, it, it means the good news. Like when, we, when we say what is good about Christianity, it's about Jesus Christ. And the Mark 1 says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I mean, this is the good news of that I'm talking about. And that when God revealed himself to humanity through, through Jesus, is when we look at, all, look at him, all the guessing games go away. The core belief of Christianity is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, which says that Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and was resurrected, and thereby offers salvation to all. I mean, in an interfaith forum, you, you may sound, seem crazy for me to proclaim this, but I honestly believe at an interfaith youth forum, it's not about seeing all faiths that are seen, but coming to the table of really showing where you believe in, what you passionately believe in, so that we can actually dialogue, so we can actually have forum. And this is what the Christian faith is, where Jesus died for our sins, he was buried, as he was resurrected, and therefore offers salvation. It is unique among all their faiths in that it is it's a relationship rather than just practices. And instead of adhering to a list of do's and don'ts, the goal of the Christian faith is to cultivate a closer walk with God. And that relationship is possible made because of Jesus Christ and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It is important to get identity right because otherwise we just relate to God in a wrong way, according to this. And that all power and all authority, as we see, when we look at the Bible, it is the one place where it declares that who God is for, for us as a Christians, and that the reason when we look at the world, it's not, it's not the way it's supposed to be. Because in the beginning, as the creator God was created, it was good. That all things, and, and at the same time, at the fall, where people disobeyed him, this is where the, the world isn't supposed to be because of sin. We're, in the beginning, God created the world, and it was good. But the fall, all relationships, with God, with ourselves, with others, and with even creation, was the relationship was destroyed. At the same time, when we talk about sin, it's a heart problem. 
and we treat others and we, we treat others and ourselves in a shameful way, we also should extend that to God. And that we should love God instead, as, as Steve, Steve said. Steve goes to my church and he was saying, we should love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind. And that we don't manage to do this. It's impossible for us to do this. That we rebel. When we talk about other laws, what's, what's so unique is that all the religions exalt men to reach up to God and grasp him and take hold. Where Christianity says, on the other hand, it's where God reaches down and down to man and really intent initiates and sustains this relationship with people. The Bible is a single source of where the truth comes from. And at the same time, the, tr the, the truth is, we, if I'm being honest with myself, is that I'm more sinful. I'm not who I am than I dare to admit. But at the same time, God loves us more than I could ever imagine. When Jesus died on the cross, it wasn't a tragic waste of life. It was a rescue. And that Jesus taught his followers that he, that he must be killed so that we may give a life as a ransom for many. As a substitute punishment, all those theological terms, wonderful things. But at the core of it is, what is a response to Jesus? For me, it was responding to him as Lord and Savior. For the Roman soldiers, they missed completely what was happening. For religious leaders, they're convinced that they already knew the way to God. For the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, he gave, he gave him away for the crowd and said, it's not my problem, just take it. The Roman centurion, though, if you read in the scripture, is he says that surely this man is the son of God. And to end off, this is, this is what I believe in, and this is the core faith of Christian. Thank you very much. It's so apparent uh, that, you know, how much passion you have, how much, uh, you know, your, your faith has given you, right, the inspiration to go from, oh my gosh, well, as a young person hating church, to now become so, uh, you know, invigorated by it. So uh, thank you for sharing that with us. I also really appreciated your message on that. Although there is a universality to a lot of what we're hearing, but ultimately it's that personal connection to, to faith, right? And being able to reach out and be receptive to that, those opportunities so that you can bring out the best self in yourself. So thank you for that. Um, for the, um, this portion, I would like to next uh, invite Rahime to share her experiences with us about uh, the core elements of her faith and how it uh, uh, has become a part of her life. So Rahime. Um, welcome to everybody. Um, before explaining my view, I must say that I'm very impressed by all the efforts spent on this event. Um, of course, there are many different ways of projecting one's thoughts through interfaith the one, but how here it is done interfaithly, I think it's very important, and so I must say thank you again to all the organizers here. Um, now, I want to start by asking a general question that I want everybody to answer in their own heads. When was the last time you completely ignored your own self and did something for the smile of another person? Um, I will leave that question for now. And first, I want to discuss about the importance of implementing what we know into practical life. What I mean is that we need to first educate ourselves to be able to speak to others. Um, first, our knowledge needs to be saved from being simple and rough information and it needs to be transformed into the sense of um, knowing a matter with the true nature and um, with all of our hearts and then it needs to be um, grasped into consciousness and, um, and um, systematic thinking. Otherwise, if what we know does not amount to anything beyond superficial information, then it would not yield any practical behavior nor make an impression on the heart. Um, as Kant also says, God cannot be known through um, theoretical behavior, but it can only be known through practical deeds. Yes, we need to educate ourselves, but first, um, we need to learn where to get information from. We not only need to um, fill ourselves from the sources that we're already familiar with, but also from um, all the assemblies, all the gatherings that we have, like these interfaith events, intercultural events, dialogue events, and everything else that we go to, we should uh, benefit efficiently from all of them. Um, if we simply want to walk on a straight path without any collisions or um, any strails, then we need to um, 
our feelings, our thoughts, our discussions, and everything else that we do and feel, they need to be um, oriented towards becoming deeper and richer for the heart and soul of ourselves first to be able to provide guidance to others. And now after educating ourselves, the next big stage comes. In this stage, we encounter with um, Islam's core method when reaching others, and it is what we call self-effacement. Now, in little senses, this is a strong phrase that um, sounds a bit frustrating, but what it truly means is reducing yourself to zero for the sake of devoting your life into helping others and making others happy. Um, Islam considers this as its um, true, Islam considers that true existence flourishes in the bottom of this consideration. Think of it this way. Um, if a seed does not drop itself into the soil, it could not be able to produce crops, correct? For example, roses, um, if, they do not, if the seed does not drop itself to decompose, to germinate, then it wouldn't be able to uh, grow any roses out of it. So, the process of um, having fruitful crops depends on um, how it's being crushed under the soil, becoming the soil, and being no one, because it is only after then that a second existence becomes possible. Um, my personal experience this year, I have been participating at several different events organized by different faith groups, and one thing I realized is that the volunteers, the only, the greatest um, difference is that they do not consider themselves to have primacy. Um, they look up to um, feeling their faith to the deepest of their hearts in order to be able to speak to others. Now, um, I know a man who devoted his entire life to this idea of new finding yourself and self-effacement, self and he left two children and his wife in his home country, and he went to many different parts, many different parts of the world, including Africa, and um, this man, my father, has always been my role model, and anytime I need support, hope, or encouragement, I always look up to him, and that's when my faith and my own spiritual life becomes the strongest. Now, um, before I become emotional, I'd just like to um, remind you about that question I asked at the beginning. When was the last time you completely ignored your own self and did something for the smile of another? And please remind yourself of the soil and voices as well. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Rahimi, for that uh, uh, story and also uh, your experiences. You know, it's uh, oftentimes we hear from other faiths as well that that uh, that need to uh, remove the, the dissolve the, the self that yourself needs so that the greater can prosper, right? And so, thank you for for sharing that. Uh, before we move on to the next portion about uh, share, having our the youth perspectives on. The positive values of our current times. Just wanted to remind our panelists as well that after uh, everybody has a chance to speak, we'll have that opportunity to, uh, you know, cross pollinate and also maybe touch upon something that maybe a previous panelist has spoken about to, you know, perhaps draw a connection there as well. So uh, on to our next portion of this section, uh, we're going to be inviting Harnor and Michaela to speak to us. Uh, the questions, the following questions were provided to them uh, to guide uh, their commentary. How does your faith help young people to feel valued, respected, and included? What are some issues that our youth are facing in our times, and how has your faith helped you go through difficult times in your personal life? Can you share with us how your faith is supportive to the idea of interfaith dialogue, respecting others while embracing their differences? And so first, I would like to call up Harnor to speak to our audience. Thank you. Hello everyone, and Satsuri Kal. Um, I'd like to just start off by uh, thanking everyone for coming out to this uh, very unique event for the Interfaith Youth Forum. Uh, this is the first time this has ever happened, and I'm glad to be a part of it. I'd like to start off by saying uh, a famous quote, or uh, a famous saying for Sikhism. Wahiguru uh, Jika Khalsa and Wahiguru Jiki Kwate. So this phrase literally translates into English by explaining that all of us are the children of God, and the good deeds that we as the children of God do, and the achievements which make the victory of God itself. So it's customary to say this phrase uh, as a day-to-day -day routine, and it's commonly used as a greeting as well. 
So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Herbert Gill, and I'm delighted to be presenting a speech on Sikhism and its relations uh, to connecting faith to youth. Uh, and it's reassuring to see people in this world like ourselves at such an inspiring event where we can all come under one roof uh, to respect each other's faith and embrace our differences. Um, regardless of ethnicity, uh, race, or religion, at the end of the day, we are all humans with a purpose. Um, before I start off, here's a little bit about myself. Um, I currently reside in Halton Hills and attend Christ the King Catholic Secondary School for the 11th grade. Uh, some of my hobbies include going out in the community to volunteer. Um, Sikhism promotes the idea of seva, and seva is the act of volunteering. Um, I like to go attend the Gurudwara, which is known as the Sikh temple, and I like to read a rate in my spare time. So without further ado, let's learn a bit about Sikhism. Uh, the first guru, uh, known as Guru Nanak Dev Ji, he founded our religion of Sikhism 500 years ago. And the soul of this guru was passed on to its nine ancestors, uh, with a total of ten gurus. Uh, today, the holy book, known as Guru Granth Sahib, is our living guru, and it has readings and texts on the faith, allowing the reader to immerse him or herself in the Sikh way of life. And in the literal meaning of Sikhism, it is the way of the follower. He is the disciple and he is the learner. The guru is our teacher. And today the religion of Sikhism uh, promotes the values of being a learner and the values of being a disciple. It has a message for all humankind. And not only is the religion of Sikhism the youngest of all religions, uh, but it is also ranked as the world's fifth largest religion. As society is learning more about Southern Asia, it is common for people to recognize someone of the Sikh faith with the turban. However, a Sikh does not need to wear a turban, as I am here. <laughs> but it is a, it's a good practice for people to um, uh, follow, but it's also common for others to visit the Gurdwara, follow the faiths, and accept the common values. Um, some guideline questions that were mentioned about uh, the youth is that uh, what are some issues that our youth are facing in our times and how has my faith of Sikhism helped um, myself as a youth go through difficult times in my personal life? So as a high school student, there's always social anxiety that I have. Um, uh, going through tests, there's always uh, things to study for, helping friends in uh, situations that they have. So I like to connect my faith of Sikhism and help myself bridge that gap between faith and uh, myself. Um, there's always peer pressure to participate in bad things. Um, high school is a tough stage to go through for everyone. I'm sure all of you have gone through it, or some are currently. Um, but the, the hardest thing can, uh, to do is going past those peer pressure situations. Um, being invited to a party with underage drinking, um, a friend that is um, going through drug abuse, and there's things that you have to go through in life. Thank you. Um, what I'd like to touch upon on this situation is that whenever a situation comes up, there's always God to look forward to. All our religions have um, a certain gap that all of us have a God that we look forward to, uh, we respect, and we, we accept his values. Um, through difficult times, there's bullying, there's studying that, I, that you have to go through, or even knowing a loved one who died. And to go through those situations, I always try to remember God as well. And the other question was, I'll try to quickly do it, um, can you share with us how my faith of Sikhism is supported to the idea of interfaith dialogue? So to start off, Sikhism does not, uh, does not do converts or conversions to our faith. Um, we like to... Uh, we like to inspire others that, as Alexander also mentioned, it's, uh, Sikhism is also a faith of interfaith dialogue. Um, <laughs> it supports other people's values and also does it with respect. Um, Sikhism teaches people to follow the path of God and how to achieve the perfect life that Guru Nanak once mentioned. And all faiths are alike, and Sikhism pro pro promotes seva, known as giving back to the community. And to end it off, I'd like to say that interfaith relations with other religions from Sikhism have always been positive. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And, uh, I'm a high school teacher myself, so I totally understand the, the pressures that young people face on a daily basis. 
and I uh, really appreciated your message of how we are all children, and in that sense, you know, we all have sometimes parts of our mind that have not matured yet, and that it's important that as we uh, stay as learners, we can learn good values that will help us through good times and bad times as well. I really appreciated those messages. Uh, next, I would like to ask Michaela to share with us uh, her uh, story about how, uh, you know, her faith has helped her through tough times and supports interfaith dialogue. Hi, I'd like to stay sitting if that's okay so I can see all of your beautiful faces. Um, I would just like to thank you all so much from my heart to be able to be here and to share with you my story, which is what I will begin with so that you can learn to understand a little bit about where I am coming from so you can understand where I am going. Now, I used to be, um, I used to be a ballet dancer, and I was months away from getting a contract in Europe. And I thought that I had everything made, and my dream was coming true, everything was working perfectly. But I had no relationship with God. Everything was about the material. What I saw, everything that I felt, every experiential thing that occurred to my life was purely about the physical. When I have sustained an incredible injury. I was no longer able to continue, and my life essentially fell apart. It is a split, like what I can describe it close more as what I can describe it as. It's as if somebody pulled the rug out from underneath you, and you're falling, and it never stops that feeling. You don't know how you're going to get out of it, and it is precisely at this moment that God entered into my life through what I will call divine intervention. I ended up traveling, giving up my life completely to God. And I was in Europe at the time. I ended up traveling to a place in Bosnia where um, part of the Catholic faith, we have Marian apparitions. And this is periods of time where the mother of God would appear to people, to young shepherd children, and give them prophetic warnings. She's doing that today, every day, for the past 33 years, in a place called Medjugorje in Bosnia. I went there, and I can only, I can't even describe the peace I felt there. The love that people have for each other is incredible. My whole life changed, and I died completely unto myself. I live only for the purpose of serving the Father. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he did not travel all over the world. He did not perform in places. He did not give sermons, write books. He followed the will of God perfectly. That is my wish for you. When I look at you now, I see a grace of God. Consider that from the beginning of the creation of the universe until the end of time, there will only be one you. Therefore, this moment right now that I have with you to be able to look into your eyes is so special and precious. And I think that a lot of the youth today have forgotten that that we don't treat each other as indi individuals that are sacred. We don't know how much time we have. We don't know what will be happening in the future, as Venerable Camus mentioned with the environment. We need to use every moment that we can to love each other. Please, I ask you, as part of this interfaith um, youth forum, let us love. Love transcends everything. All virtues lead to love. That is all we need. We can heal the world. We can fix our planet. <laughs> I firmly believe that we are the ones we have been praying for. And I am taking responsibility in my life to do what I think the Lord is calling me to do. So in doing that, I'm living for the other. 
I'm trying to demonstrate by example what it means to completely forget yourself and to live solely for the purposes of establishing the kingdom of heaven on earth. Now, I ask you, please, to have enough courage, have enough strength to walk the path of love. It is easy to judge people. It is easy to demean others and be indifferent. It takes courage and bravery to love, to help the person that is on the street. And that is what we're here for. We're here for others. Thank you. Thank you for today. That was such a, a touching, you know, story of that. And thank you for sharing that experience. A very personal experience, of course, that shows how um, you know God had manifested itself to uh, help you, and that it is truly, you know, not through reading, not through words only, but you have to truly embody what you believe in, and to be able to put it forward, uh, because we are all sacred and we're all capable of that positive change and influence. So thank you for that experience. Um, we're gonna move on to the last uh, third of our uh, 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 facilitation panel, uh, which is about integrating faith and passion into our lives. And for this portion, I will be inviting Hector and Rachel to speak to, to you. Uh, the questions that they were provided to guide them were, were the following. How did your faith influence your values and passions? How would you help youths develop their own faith and passion? In what ways did faith help you uh, to search for their own identity? And so I'd like to pass the mic off to Hector. I, uh, while listening to everybody else, I changed what I wanted to say twice. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Um, I, I, I want to highlight one aspect of, um, of the Christian faith, specifically of the um, Catholic Church, that, that has always resonated with me uh, in, in, in my life and, and has given me a lot of hope and, and, and passion. Um, and it is religious communities or the, the life of those who um, dedicate all who they are to, um, to their faith. Um, these religious communities have a particular um, charism. It's a, it's a gift. It's a gift that they are meant to give to others. So that's how they understand their mission. Okay? Um, um, many, many of you may know them. They are the Franciscans and the Dominicans and the, the Jesuits, and each one of them has one person. is either to teach or to help the poor or to, but it's something very specific that you're given so that you can return to the world. Um, now I want to push a little further from, from that. Um, I'm originally from Colombia, and um, the experience there is the experience of joy and sorrow at the same time. Um, Colombia has lived the longest conflict in the world besides the Middle East, and uh, it's a conflict that kills thousands of people every week. Um, and we've kind of gotten used to it because there is nothing really we can do to change it. Um, I know that, that what we are discussing here is how to use kind of faith to like launch us into into changing the world, to mobilize us, to understand that that the world could be a better place. Um, but my reflection tries to go one step further and say, what if we can't change the world? Are we going to stop in following that path of love? Are we going to stop? Uh, doing good things for the environment. If we know, let's say we somebody comes from the future and tells us, uh, well, we are going to, climate change is going to continue and we're going to ruin the world. What is going to happen in that case? Should we just stop and stay at home and continue with our lives? Well, my experience from what happens in Colombia is no. Is um, through their faith, people continue loving, continue 
acting for each other, for the environment, for uh, whatever cause they are committed to. They don't need to see the results. They don't need to see how the world is going to be changed. They just need to have that firm commitment that tells them that their faith is about turning the attention from themselves to the others. Um, that is what I'm passionate about. That is what uh, my faith has been passionate about. And that's what has led me to be in, in interfaith contexts. Because it's not turning like, my attention from myself to whoever is in front of me who is Catholic or Christian, but it's to whoever is in front of me, no matter who they are and where they come from. And going back to that first reflection, is to do exactly what the religious communities do, is to get that gift that, I'm, that I've been given, whatever it is, as simple as it is, and be able and open to share that with whoever is in front of me. And in a very golden rule style, to accept that whoever that person in front of me is, they have a gift, and that gift is meant for them to share and for me to receive openly. Um, uh, I just want to conclude with, since many, many, uh, have, many of you have already quoted different passages of the scripture, I, from your particular traditions, I just want to uh, say that this is Easter time for, for, for Christians, and uh, the message that we receive every weekend, this Easter time especially, is what Jesus says when he it walks into kind of like their apostles being confused and not knowing what to do, and it's always peace be with you. So I want to leave you with that. Peace be with you, and thank you very much for organizing this. Thank you so much, Andrew. And isn't it so true that, you know, if, uh, that we all have something to offer, and you know, if not just the one thing, but if it is just one thing to offer, you know, to offer to the world and to truly. Uh, you know, be a representative of what you want to uh, show and what you believe. And, and thank you for not that just the one thing you shared many things with us. We we'll really appreciate it. Thank you for being so flexible. I mean, everybody kind of took what you wanted to say, and you still managed to uh, <laughs> come up with something you need. Thank you for that. Last but not least, uh, I'd like to invite Rachel to speak to our audience today. So. Faith was one of the most important things in life, and people were proud of it. Uh, now in today's society, uh, faith and religion is set aside by other things such as work, school, friends, and family. Faith is one of the things that are less important because people don't know how to integrate faith into their busy lives. When I was looking over the topic of how faith and uh, how faith has influenced my values and passions, I had no clue what my values and passions are. As I got thinking about my youth group and what I do in the Jewish community, I realized what I was passionate about. There's this youth group that I'm a part of called Nifty Now, which stands for North American Federation of Temple Youth and the region of Northeast Lakes. This regional youth group includes Toronto and the GTA, Ottawa, Buffalo, Rochester, and Cleveland. Now, on a smaller scale, I'm a part of my temple youth group, uh, Mighty, Mississauga Intrepid Temple Youth. And I'm on board as programming vice president and membership vice president, where I encourage teens around my age to come out to events. I also write and plan programs for these events, and being involved in these groups has helped me realize my passions, that faith and religion are wonderful things. It has given me opportunities that I wouldn't experience in high school or in a workplace. The one thing that I've found is that being involved within your religious community is that it can bring so many different leadership opportunities. It allows you to have a voice where it may not uh, be heard in other situations. Faith has given me a sense of community, or kahila uh, kadosha, as we would say in Hebrew. Being involved gives me a sense of community and a feeling of a second home that I would never get anywhere else uh, through friendships and bonds that I have made with others. Faith has influenced my values and passions in a huge way, and I couldn't be more grateful to have it be such a big part of my life. Uh, now, many of us believe that the only way to worship or express our faith is through attending church or mosque or temple to get closer to God. 
But in reality, there are many other ways of doing so other than going to our place of worship. By doing something you love can bring you closer to God, whether it be sitting alone in a room, meditating, or uh, doing daily prayers. To help youth develop their own faith and passion to bring them closer to God, there are many ways of doing so. For example, getting involved within your religious community or finding something you love by trying new things. Developing your faith and passion is a personal adventure that everyone should experience uh, and grow as an individual. Getting involved with something you love can help find what you're passionate about. Personally, I would encourage youth to try something they've never done before and step out of their comfort zone because you never know until you try. Developing faith and passion is what someone needs in their life and can help them get through tough times just like it's helped me so much in many different ways. It's helped me through the loss of loved ones, through stressful times, and it also lifts my spirits during joyous occasions. Everyone has their own identity. Uh, some may know exactly who they are, and some may have no clue of who they are. I am one of those people that still don't know who they are. I'm still learning and growing as a person, so I can't just define myself as one thing for the rest of my life. Faith has helped me a lot in figuring out the kind of person I am and the person that I want to be. It has helped me find what I love and what I'm passionate about by stepping out of my comfort zone and trying new things and meeting new people. As an example, when I was a kid, I was super shy and I would dread speaking in front of a class, let alone in this environment, I would be terrified. Um, now that I have been a part of the uh, regional youth group and uh, for over a year now, I have come out of my shell and I'm not afraid to say what's on my mind. Uh, the person I was three, maybe four years ago, I would never see uh, myself as the person I am today. Uh, coming up in the next year, I have taken on a leadership position that I'm really excited about and allows me to be me. It has brought out the energetic person in me and has really helped me in other situations. Now, enough talking about uh, myself and my experiences. The point I'm trying to convey is that faith can help figure out who you are, even if you have no idea. If you know who you are, and uh, faith can help solidify and uh, strengthen your points of view on uh, and your values. Uh, in conclusion, faith is a wonderful thing from influencing one's values to figuring out the person you want to be. Faith and religion can do wonders. It uh, can influence your own life and can be as big or as little uh, a part of your life as you want it to be. Since faith isn't uh, one of the biggest priorities in life, uh, one can choose to put it ahead of others as values come with age. Now, just uh, lastly, I want to leave you with this question to reflect on. Ask yourself how faith influences your life and what can you do to bring your faith and your passions into your life even more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, one of the messages that I kind of skimmed across, went across my brain when you were talking was a very famous phrase by Drake, which is YOLO. Yeah. You only live once. But in, in, in that, I want to stretch on the positive piece of that idea is that you only live once. So you should definitely try to uh, find that opportunity to find a, a community right, that will support you, that will allow you to uh, understand and learn about yourself more in this journey in life. And that, you know, we all, and I look at this whole panel here, is that I have never felt so affirmed for our future right, ever before. My daughters are in great hands. And that uh, each one of every single of these uh, panelists here have such a wonderful guide, right? Guiding them through their personal journey, but also through their greater journey of what they want to do for this world. Um, I was very lucky to have that opportunity uh, to do my teaching internship in Brazil, in Sao Paulo where uh, the temple there hosted uh, me. At the same time, they hosted the Dalai Lama. And uh, he was hosting an interfaith event there. And when, when he spoke, that left a, an impression on me, uh, was that everybody should be involved in a good religion and have faith. That all good religions teach, right? You to love, to have compassion, and to be appreciative. And that when we all strive for that common goal, it breaks down all human barriers and walls. And when those walls come crashing down, then we are all in the same place together. He said that for him, Buddhism was what worked for him. And he recognized that for others, it might be some other religions, right? 
Uh, but that, as long as it's a good religion, it will teach you those values. And I have, without a doubt, that no, that is so strong and apparent amongst our panelists right now. Uh, on to our next section. I uh, would like to uh, offer our panelists uh, perhaps a chance to uh, draw a connection to what they heard uh, prior uh, to um, uh, their uh, chance to speak and to see if there's a chance for some cross-pollination or some cross-connections here. So would anybody uh, like to offer uh, some commentary on perhaps what they heard from our other panelists? Alex? I see you making eye contact. Oh, okay, no, that was just, no, just making eye contact. Thanks, Michaela. Um, I would just like to speak to Reki Mae. Um, I found it very beautiful what you were speaking about with the seed that it must be planted and cultivated, that um, we cannot bear fruit if we do not die into ourselves. And we don't know the effect that we have on others through the words that we speak. And I would just like to thank you for coming here and sharing with us your words because they inspire other people in their hearts and that in turn creates positive action and change so that we're more cohesive as um, um, a compassionate society. And um, I would really like to thank you for that. <laughs> and also, Steve Lee, I really respect that you are literally trying to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth. We need many more people like you because we need to do it together. Thank you very much. I know you're helping too. We're going to build this heaven on earth. So you know, we're all doing uh, our parts for sure. Uh, would anybody else like to comment uh, on another one of our panelists? Skipping through their notes. In the teaching world, we call this wait time. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Um, it is uh, less of a comment, but uh, maybe a question that could spark further conversation. Um, I, I think one of the uh, um, overlapping topic here is environmental protection and the pursuit of justice. Um, I'd like to ask the panelists, uh, what is the point of justice? Why are we pursuing justice? And how does our faith get involved with it? Why are we trying to be compassionate? Why are we trying to love others? What is the point of that? I, I, I think we know the answer, but I'd like to have a discussion. <laughs> Would anybody like to respond to Steve? All right. Thank you, Alexander. Thanks. Oh. Well, uh, actually, yeah. In this regard, I actually found uh, um, Hector's uh, comments uh, very inspiring when he asked, um, even if what we're doing can't make a difference, will we will we still try to do good? Um, and and uh, actually uh, drawing drawing also upon this theme of uh, building uh, the kingdom of uh, heaven on earth, which is an interesting uh, uh, interesting saying because we use a very similar one at Folk on Shan, building the pure land on earth, is well, if we don't have a community, if suppose we didn't have the great communities that we do have to work together uh, for our our religious goals, would we uh, would we still uh, continue uh, pursuing our goals? And I think we would. I think that we would still try to realize uh, that um, or like Jerusalem or the pure land on earth individually, even if there wasn't anyone else in that kingdom because of faith, because of that firm knowledge from uh, either our experiences, uh, experiencing miracles or what have you, or uh, a grad, be it a gradual experience. Uh, but actually, uh, Calvin talks about this certainty of salvation, which, um, which I think is also uh, 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 a similar, a similar theme. I think it's that kind of uh, um, firm groundedness which would keep us acting uh, in a wholesome way, in a good way, regardless of whether we could see the evidence of its uh, of its uh, fruit. Um, and maybe uh, to uh, draw on 
our panelist at, at the end's comment, sorry, I, I forgot where he made your comment. Uh, perhaps, uh, Kent, as Kant said, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, that morality is evidence of, uh, of the uh, divine will or of the Torah or what have you. Uh, perhaps that's also, uh, or, or perhaps that's also something uh, to do with it. Thank you so much, Alexander. Um, I guess uh, we want to also make sure there's an opportunity for you and the audience to ask uh, our panelists questions as well. So I believe I've been given uh, the opportunity to ask for two questions from the floor. Would anybody from the floor like to uh, ask our panelists a question? Okay, I would say in the teaching world that is sufficient wait time. <laughs> and so and I think everybody is probably just you know uh, absorbing all this information. Oh, we do have a hand up. Thank you very much. See, this is why they call it wait time. We have to make sure we wait. Well, I appreciate it. Oh. the opportunity to speak. I talk too much at this temple, ordinarily anyway. First of all, I want to say how impressed I am with all the speakers and everything that's being said. Not only your dedication to faith, but also your ability to communicate at the ages that you are and see nothing but good things ahead for all of you. Uh, from my point of view, I guess what my question is, since I am not, I'll call it a youth, is to what is the message you would give to other youth? You've talked several times about your faith. You've talked about the direction that you're going. Also at times, I think in particular, when you talked uh, about the challenges you faced at high school and, and so forth, in particular yourself. Um, obviously, each one of you inspire. But how do you communicate? How do you translate the message to other youth with so many distractions in this world particularly electronic and visual distractions. So maybe this is something you've already considered. If not, maybe a couple of you could just ask how you handle that. Thank you. All right. It's a great question, actually. Um, as, as a high school student, there's always uh, lots of things to distract you. There's social media, uh, Twitter, Facebook. I know most of us don't use Facebook anymore. <laughs> um, but just to expand on that, um, Definitely, faith has been, uh, it's, it's been lingering away from youth in our age. Um, youth, have been, uh, youth have the opportunity in front of them. Everything's in front of them. It's just applying everything that's in front of us. Um, as a youth, I can say that uh, I, I like to go to um, the Gurdwara, known as the Sikh Temple, at least um, as much as I can. Um, through uh, just being a youth, it's, it's not only not only hard to get assignments done, have fun with your friends, or try to um, just uh, be a part of the family, and um, always, always try to bridge that gap between uh, faith and your social life. Um, as much, as much as it's stressed um, onto us to get good grades, uh, do well in school, um, it's it should also be stressed upon youth that uh, we should always um, try to bridge that gap that faith has with us. Um, it's, it's the opportunities that we have now, and it was discussed before that youth shouldn't just be looking into the future, it's the now. I believe um, it was mentioned before that it's the present it also has its opportunities. It's not only the future that holds opportunities for you. And um, it's important that we bridge this gap between faith and the youth of today. So that's all I have to say. Thank you for that, Bernard. And Hector, would you like to share a few words? Just a, a quick comment there. Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that we all chose personal stories. Um, I think that a uh, big part of our kind of activism with other youth is to be that, to be that presence, to be that story that can engage others. 
Um, certainly from my own personal experience, uh, I may send as many messages through Facebook and Twitter and all of that, and they are not as effective as being there, being able to tell my story in a way that the other youth are, are relating to it. Um, and especially because it has that faith component to it. I, I think that, and I, I think it, it's, we, we've ex kind of expressed different aspects of that, of that. Each one of us has a different part of the story that relates either the high school or the ethnic background. Or, but it, if it's just concept, it's just so difficult to, to relate to. And there are so many distractions in the way. If it is a person, I think you relate to that very well. Thank you for that, Hector. Bosco, did you want to? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it was a good question. Um, I think one of the things that for this, this generation, this youth, or even the, just everyone, that it's not just for youth alone, is really we live in an age where information is about. Like, there's, we've, we've got so many resources, as Steve Lee even said just now, like, we, we, a five days military budget can easily solve so many problems. But at the same time, we, uh, why isn't it happening? Right? Why, uh, why is it not? And we have to really question ourselves, like, are we more in love with the idea of, of change and good and justice, or are we actually in love with what it is? And that, takes, and that really takes self-deep reflection, critical thinking, and also at least the willingness to be open to be wrong. To simply just be, like, well, we, we even come, like, they say the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and that's it. And we, oftentimes we have good intentions going in, without being experts, without being really spending and digging deep and having actual like conversion. In term, when I say conversion, like rather than someone telling us that we should do good, it's the world telling us that we should do this, rather than like, why are we actually doing it? Why does justice matter? For, for me, justice matters because God loves justice. Because God is just. And, and that's why everything I said just now wasn't just the things I said, it was because everything else I've done, from soup kitchens to whatever, everything comes out of that. And at the same time, there's also a reality where you realize, you know what, you're going to do it wrong. You're going to do it wrong. And because we are, we are selfish, we're selfish people, we look to our own interests, even when, we, when we're fully guided by faith, it, it, there's a limit. So really asking, what is it? Why, why are we doing so little with so much that we have? And what are we actually doing? Mm -hmm. And Steve, I believe you have a, a comment as well. Very quick answer. Uh, I really appreciate the adults who are here. Uh, the answer to your question about what you need and what I would recommend to you is find mentors, find adults that you can look up to by examples from their personal stories because uh, I, I really believe that's what we're profoundly lacking in our generation, adults that we can look up to uh, to follow their examples. Uh, she mentioned her father. We've all talked about our personal experiences, our family experiences. Uh, if the adults in this room changed from themselves and their children and afterwards, uh, it would really create a big change. Oh, uh, thank you for that, Steve. Uh, Michaela, I was just instructed that we have some questions from San Francisco, actually. Uh, are we going to be able to play that? Hi, San Francisco. Uh, hi. I'm in San Francisco. Can you guys hear me? Hi. Hi. Hi, this is Randy from San Francisco. Hi. Um, so I just want to chip in on the discussion between the panelists, um, say a couple things. And so I, I really like this theme that everyone, you know, in all sorts of religions, all beliefs, everyone has this foundation of love and faith is very, very important. And so uh, we had the discussion inside our, our room about how love and faith is extremely important. But one thing that's kind of overlooked is wisdom. And so it's very important to have faith and love for people, but say for example that you have faith and love for the wrong things. So uh, this could come from perhaps brainwashing, and so brainwashing you can imagine is to force someone else's beliefs onto another person. And so then that person has some their own set of love and faith for something that they maybe shouldn't have uh, these feelings for. And so I think it's really important to also emphasize that we need to be wise about our rationale and have good reasons as to why we believe what we believe in. Um, and so, you know, every religion, every faith is based on the foundation that we need to set a set of boundaries, rules, and practices 
to live as a community, to live as a group of people and to have peace and harmony. And so a lot of these decisions, uh, they're not fully just, you know, we should do this because this is the only way to live, but it's also there's a sense of being practical, there's a sense of being wise, there's a sense of we should do this and we choose to do this instead of something else. So there's also a huge sense of, uh, of logic behind everything. And so I just wanted to say that I really like all these religions, everyone's coming together and we're talking about this in a very logical, very rational way. So I appreciate that. It's not a lot of religion saying, you know, this is what I believe in and this is why I believe it. You know, there's there's a set of uh, there's there's reasons behind everything, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, San Francisco. That's a uh, we've uh, valued that input. You know, it brings me uh, back to when Alexander was talking about how you know what faith is is through you know experience and time and. And you know, perhaps that wisdom piece is that we do have that, uh, that we do take that time to, um, you know, not just uh, no, put ourselves through those experiences and whether they are good or bad to, to grow from them. You know, um, what happens to a clam that is irritated by a piece of sand, right? Well, that sand turns into a pearl. And so, uh, on that note, uh, I would like to thank all of our panelists. Please give them a round of applause. And we are going to be transitioning over to a 10 minute break, at which point then my partner Fabian will be taking over. But I'll let Andrew take over this piece. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Stephen, and uh, thank you to all our panelists and our friends in uh, San Francisco. So as Stephen mentioned, we're gonna take a quick five to 10 minute break. Uh, please use a refreshment in the back. Uh, a special thank to the Intercultural Dialogue Institute who prepared the Noah pudding as a symbol of celebrating cultural and religious richness and diversity. So uh, help yourself, we're going to take a quick 5 to 10 minute break. I uh, have a chance to interact with other youth and uh, build your network. So we'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you everybody. We hope you have the chance to branch out and network with everybody. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite part of events like this is to see your ever expanding list of Facebook friends and your LinkedIn connection grow after this. Um, now I'd like to hand over to the second part of the afternoon, our second panel, uh, the panel, the facilitator, Mr. Fabian Yu. Fabian is the president of Toronto Subdivision, a Buddhist Light International Association Young Adult Division. He coordinates a youth education and leadership program at Fo Wang Shan Temple of Toronto. He's also established the first Buddhist club at Queen's University during his undergrad and has represented Toronto Buddhist Light International Association, YAD, in multiple international conferences. Please welcome Fabian. Thank you. Um, so I'm just uh, going to save time. I'm going to invite all the second uh, panelists to come on stage. So they're going to be uh, Yusuf Dagar, Natasha Armstrong, James, uh, let's give them all a big round of applause for you. James Magnesium, Joanna Chu, Renata Lane, and also Emily Patelma. Uh, uh, thank you very much. All right, so um, I think we had a wonderful first session where we really delved into the stories of the uh, individual uh, faith groups and uh, different uh, passions of all the individuals. The second part really is kind of the key part. Talking about everything is great, sharing experiences is great, but what are we going to do about it? And uh, when, we, when we had our uh, North American Youth Conference, one of the main things we wanted to try to do is make sure that every group learned something and took it back to their own groups. So this next section is really going to be about uh, each group's uh, experience in community involvement, what they have done, and what are some social issues uh, that they're working towards. And so uh, as with our first panel, I'm just going to sit down now. As with our first panel, uh, we're going to go over three different topics. The first topic, we're going to invite uh, Mr. Yusef Daglar and also Natasha Armstrong to talk about this. And our first topic is going to be about uh, community involvement and projects. And so the majority of faith traditions typically place quite a bit of emphasis uh, in regards to helping the needy and those that are unfortunate. So specifically, can you highlight some of the uh, some of what you've done for your faith group and about the roles that you have uh, in regards to community involvement and also social uh, responsibility? Are there any examples of what your group has done this year? And are there some driving factors that you want to encourage other groups to use and also encourage your group first? So uh, might I invite uh, Mr. Risa Daglar to start first? And so we have two mics uh, on each side, so perfect. Thank you very much, Vivian. 
So before I begin, I would like to thank the Bohan Shan Temple for organizing and hosting this event of uh, interfaith dialogue. Um, I just want to say that the more we learn and know, the more we understand. And the more we understand each other, the more we realize that we're not so different after all. And that we all unite under the common factor of humanity. So I would like to begin by saying that all praise is due to God, the ruler and sustainer of the universe. Community service is an essential factor within Islam. Therefore, I will elaborate briefly on the matter from two aspects. The emphasis placed on community and the emphasis placed on service. We humans have been created as social beings. God Almighty has created us, given us life, and placed us into communities. He has organized us in such a manner because he favors the community. In one of his traditions, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has stated, the helping hand of God is with the community. The messenger of God, peace be upon him, has also stated that two people are better than one, three are better than two, four are better than three. Meaning that the more people we have in a community, the more beneficial it is. The importance of community cannot be limited to these two traditions alone. As Muslims, we're obligated to perform prescribed prayers five times a day. During our prayers, we recite verses from the Holy Quran. We supplicate and pray to God in the form and manner that He has willed for us. The most frequently recited section from the Quran is called Fatiha. Every day, at least 40 times, we recite Iyaka na'udu wa Iyaka nasta'in, which means it is you we worship and you we ask for help. Now I'm not going to get into the grammatical details of this verse, but it's important to know that it can also be stated, or it could have also stated, it is you that I worship and you that I ask for help. Although we generally recite these verses individually, God has willed us to supplicate as a community, once again to remind, reminding us of the value that it places, that He places upon community. Now that we've established the appraisal that God has placed upon community, let's look into what Islam says about serving the community. In Islam, we are obligated to consider the rights of all people that we share a community with. One of the greatly stressed rights within our belief is the right of the neighbor. The word neighbor, according to our understanding, does not only imply the house that is directly in front or beside us. Some scholars have stated that the term neighbor encompasses up to 40 houses in all directions. Therefore, it would be safe to say that the term neighbor's rights could be equally translated into the term community rights. In one tradition, the messenger of God, peace be upon him, teaches that he who sleeps on a full stomach while his neighbor is hungry is not one of us or cannot be considered a true believer. According to this tradition, a true believer does not have the luxury of being selfish. A true believer owes a duty to his fellow man. And in the words of the Prophet, also known as the Golden Rule, none of us is a true believer until we desire for a brother that which we desire for ourselves. So how are we going to reach our goal? How will we, the people of Earth, inspire civic awareness? The most effective solution to raising civic awareness is through education. It is crucial to educate our youth regarding this matter from the early years of their lives. Because as a wise man, man has said, if you're planning for a year, plant rice. If you're planning for 10 years, plant trees. And if you're planning for 100 years, educate children. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Okay, yeah, one thing just to stress, I think what, uh, one point that you mentioned, the idea of community service, bringing more people into action, I think really uh, is a very inspiring note, and also the idea of the neighbors uh, extending outward and inspiring more people. And I'd like to invite the next uh, Natasha Armstrong, representing a World Vision Canada, to uh, share her experiences. Thank you. So again, my name is Natasha. And I first want to thank uh, Cindy and the Interfaith Youth Forum Planning Committee for allowing me to, be, to be here with you, um, just to kind of share my heart on this topic of faith, social justice, and then also the work of World Vision. So I think there's nothing better um, than knowing that before I came into this world, that God, the creator of everything, had a really unique and amazing plan for me. The funny thing, though, is that when I was a kid, I didn't really know that. I didn't really get it. I did grow up in a Christian home, but I really didn't know what Christianity was all about. Um, and it's not because of anything that my family did, but mainly because I was a young person so focused on just living for me. But then I had what you would call kind of like a major life crisis. Um, and it was a crisis where rather than kind of running away from God, I find myself kind of running towards him asking him to explain certain things to me, like why certain things happen, why there's so much pain in the world, and why things that seem so simple seem to at times get more and more complicated. And that's when my life changed. As Christians, we believe that God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to earth, so that whoever believes in him would not perish, but would have eternal, everlasting life. That our willful faults, like our sins and things that we do that we really know are deep down inside we shouldn't be doing, that those things would be forgiven from. And that we could kind of walk in this, this new freedom of just forgiveness and that all that weight would be kind of lifted off of us. And it's a freedom that's rooted in compassion, kindness, gentleness, self-control, it's grace and mercy, but also significant to our conversation in doing justice. See, it's a freedom, freedom sorry, that is rooted in three things really. And it's funny because Steve said these things earlier today, too. The first one really is like loving God. The second one is loving others. And then the third one is really loving justice. That is to advocate or speak for those who sometimes don't have a voice to speak for themselves. See, my faith is what fuels my commitment to advocating and fighting for children who are experiencing poverty, both here locally in Canada, but then also abroad in some of the harshest places in our world. A world vision we know as Christians, we are called by God to not only be kind, patient, gentle, and charitable to our neighbors, but also to stand up for what's right, even in the face of really, really heavy adversity. So this is key to our faith as Christians, but also to the work that we do at World Vision. As a Christian relief, development, and advocacy organization, we are passionately committed to fighting for the rights of children, families, and communities working side by side them to overcome injustice and poverty. And we're on the ground in nearly 100 countries, which is really awesome. And to us, every person, every child is precious, beautiful, and deserves to experience life in all its fullness so that they too can walk in the amazing plan and new purpose that God has created for them. Our world vision is our constant prayer for our hearts to grow with the things that break us. In fact, it was Bob Pierce, our founder, who had the exact same prayer when he established World Vision in 1947. Here we are committed to ensuring that children, no matter what their ethnicity, religion, gender, political status, children who are part of the 805 million people worldwide who don't have enough food to eat every day, are cared for. And we care for them through things like child sponsorship program, emergency food relief, and even education initiatives. We want all children to be given an opportunity to experience life in all its fullness, exactly how God intended it. So for the last several years, my heart has been really committed to that. In fact, while working with World Vision Canada, I was working in Toronto, and really some of the poorest neighborhoods, not only in Canada, but then also in North America, in communities like Regent Park, St. James, and the First Nations communities. And what we do is we create community action plans, really based on issues that were bugging us about our community, and then we drive down to Parliament Hill and meet with senators and advocate, talk about the issues that were bothering us. And then we would come back down to the city of Toronto and execute those plans right in the heart of the city, with the government's help, of course. Now as a youth and student engagement coach, I get to ignite a fire in youth all across Canada to grow as leaders and social justice activists who are equipped and fired up to advocate for the rights of children who are experiencing extreme poverty. 
Things like hunger, starvation, malnutrition, child labor, and lack of access to education. And God gives us the power and the humility to accomplish that. And it's a youth movement that's happening all over the world, and it's open to everybody. And I think soon, I think we'll be able to kind of share some projects and kind of discuss that, but um, yeah, I just want to kind of implore everybody that social justice and youth go hand in hand. So thank you. Thank you very much, Tasha. It's really great to hear how you went through your personal journey and how you're questioning things and how uh, it's gotten to you thinking where you are. Okay, so we're going to move on to our second topic, which is youth voices on social issues uh, in regards to environmental protection and other initiatives. So we're really lucky that we're in the uh, greater Toronto area where we're really considered one of the most multicultural uh, locations. We have an abundance of different cultures and faiths. Uh, so in that regard, religious freedom is also uh, given to us. And I would like to uh, invite uh, James and also Joanna to share a little bit of experiences on this. Um, are there specific issues uh, that are pertaining to your group or your, uh, your religious faith that is important in your tradition that lets you uh, have certain events and certain things? And has there any, uh, been any uh, push for change and how's your success in that regard? Thank you. So we'll invite James to go first. Thank you. Hi, um, as um, uh, the host just mentioned, my name is James. Uh, I am a writer for Youth Speak News, and my speech is going to be a bit different um, from the previous speeches, um, as I don't have a particular story, but I do have um, what my grade school Catholic teachers would call a uh, gift of God. I mean, I'm not trying to say I'm the best writer. Oh, God, okay. This isn't going right. Um, basically, what I'm trying to say is I believe that everyone here was blessed with a specific talent, a specific gift, a specific purpose that we're all meant to find. And I feel like what I'm going to be talking today is the sort of youth voice uh, that I've been given or that I feel um, I'm going to try and work towards. Um, I'm a writer, it's not my job, I don't get paid to write, nor do I ever want that to be a motivation to write. It's not a hobby of mine. Um, hobbies, in my opinion, are pleasant things that you do on your spare time. Um, things that are like plan B for your regular schedule. Writing is something that I do to give meaning to the unexpected, to what may seem unfathomable. It is what I do to understand the sorrow the confusion, the anger, and the joy that exists out there in the world. Writing is my necessity. Unlike a job or a hobby, writing does not come second to my health. It is my health. It is my survival, and in my opinion, it is the survival of all of humanity. This feeling, it probably isn't mutual to everyone, because we all have our own unique purposes, our own unique um, necessities uh, that are as important as food, is wa food and water that we believe um, we were born for, and that we try and use these sort of necessities, these tools, these talents, um, to try and advance our world. What is mutual to everyone um, in this temple here today is faith and spirituality. Now, to frame your understanding of where I'm coming from uh, with writing, um, I like to imagine writing as a parallel of acts of faith. Um, as a Catholic, I pray to God. Not just our fathers and Hail Marys, but I usually like to have a conversation with God while I'm praying. Um, let God know how I'm doing. Um, thank Him for blessing us with awesome weather, um, blessing us with great friends. Um, and I'm sure that other faiths can relate as well. I'm pretty sure um, that here it's Islam, here it's Judaism, can obviously attest to the power of prayer. Um, Buddhism, for example, I believe. Um, their practice of meditation is another liberating and refreshing experience um, that really connects them to their world. So, just as prayer and meditation connects us more to the forces that are around us, within us, and above us, so too does writing, and all the more when writing comes from a voice of faith. I write as a member of Youth Speak News, a program with the Catholic Register. And I believe that writing and faith come hand in hand when it comes to personal and social matters. So one of the first columns that I wrote for you to speak news is actually um, the importance of faith and mental illness. I wrote about um, an experience that I had with one of my friends who was going through a mental illness. Um, and I talked about how faith can be there for you when it seems like it's hopeless, when things seem really dark and down. 
Faith is some loyal and consistent force that's always with you. But of course, writing and faith go especially hand in hand when it comes to social issues. Um, I, I hope that you've all heard or that you're aware of the fact that um, a couple months ago in January or February, I can't remember which, uh, two homeless men died of hypothermia in Toronto. Both men were found outside in the freezing cold. One was found in a bus shelter, one was found um, at the back of a truck. And I remember feeling so, so upset. And I asked myself, why in one of the world's greatest cities should we have an overwhelming number of homeless people, many of which are youth not much older than us? Of course, issues like lack of affordable housing, viable job opportunities, and a limited um, budget towards the issues of homelessness seem to have taken a back seat for the latest Ford scandal in Toronto. As a writer for the Catholic Register, I found it was my responsibility, my necessity as a Catholic and a writer and a human being to tell the story of the 5,000 homeless people in Toronto. And just as we pray for a better world, my writing was a prayer spoken to the readers of the Catholic Register, a call for help. It's easy to take for granted the things that we are told in the media, the things that other people tell us in reality. However, we build our lives on narratives. Our lives are narratives themselves. Writing is just that kind of venue. And when you can realize this and use it to your advantage, to the advantage of your faith, your value and your beliefs, you have such a powerful tool to change the world. Thank you very much, Jason. It was really great to hear how you can use the power of speech and your passion and love for writing can impact others as well. So I'd like now like to invite Joanna to speak. Thank you very much. So hello everyone, my name is Joanna. I am a member of the um, YAD group here in uh, Pogonsan Temple. So YAD stands for uh, Young Adult Division. And basically we are a um, smaller piece of the pie of what um, is known as the organization of Buddhist Light International Association. So this is an association uh, created by Pogonsan Temple that represents lay people practicing Buddhist, uh, humanistic Buddhism. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we have incorporated faith into um, societal change. So of course, BLIA, or Buddhist Light International Association, was created, again, to promote uh, or propagate humanistic Buddhism. But more importantly, the organization has carried out many activities and supported various societal causes. The goals are to create, obviously, peace and purification in the world and provide help, help for those who are suffering. And the most important thing and underlying objective is to bring help to those in society, regardless of their gender, race, or religious beliefs. Buddhism teaches us um, one of the biggest lessons that I have incorporated into my life is compassion. How to show compassion to all things. Um, how to show kindness and respect to others and treat others the way you would like to be treated. Ultimately, working towards a world of equality, joyfulness, and perfect peace by joining both local and global communities. So the initiatives held by BLIA are categorized into four main um, aspects, including education, poverty, um, disaster relief, and environmental protection, which we will talk about a little bit later. So um, what uh, BLA has done all over the world is provide education and use education as a tool to break the cycle of poverty. Um, many people around the world have very limited access to basic things you and I take for granted. For example, the cup of water you have in front of you, or um, you know, even good sanitation, or basic needs that people do not have access to. And education, obviously, again, would not be something that um, will come before that. So um, BLA has um, built many schools and places like Brazil, in South Africa, giving um, children, especially women or girls, a chance at an education, a chance at creating a sustainable future and gaining skills to create a sustainable life. Um, more importantly, we are teaching these people um, simple humanistic Buddhist teachings for them to have a meaningful and fulfilling life. And more importantly, for to one day be able to pay it forward and sh um, demonstrate compassion that we have shown them to other people and do the same that BLA members are doing all over the world to more and more people. More locally, I am involved with the Toronto YID group, so Toronto Young Adult Division group, and we have um, supported and engaged in various activities throughout the year. 
um, one of which is the CN Tower climb, which um, supports causes created by the United Way. Um, so that United Way has this mission of creating poverty into possibility. So they engage in activities that um, have or develop have mud, or sorry, employment and skill development, um, access to afford, affordable housing and transportation, and even emergency shelters, and that was one of the main causes we supported as young adults. And I think that the biggest reason why I continue to stay in this youth group and why I see many of our um, youth members around the temple is that idea of compassion. That at the same time, we are all motivated to show compassion to some way in some manner. And I hope that um, although this is, um, you know, and in Buddhist idealism, this is something that we discuss in all religions and something that we can come together to create a positive message in this world. Um, I hope that through the action project later that we'll discuss, we can really create some change and have a really good discussion today. Thank you. YID, mostly for compassion, and it seems to be highlighted again and again in a different way from all our panels, very much for that. Um, so we're going to move on to our last uh, question, which we'll, uh, we'll invite Donata and also Emily to speak on this. And this is visioning of the future and the hope for youth uh, within the community. So I'd like to uh, ask, uh, the question is basically, uh, what is the view of future in regards to your community and your faith group? How, how do you see it changing in the role of your community and also in your role as a leader? And has it changing and, and what are the some things that you can share with us? Uh, can you highlight any certain uh, areas uh, that your youth can contribute more uh, or have a better impact on? So if uh, I invite uh, Ms. Donato to start first. Thank you. Thank you. So can I have everybody stand up? Let's do a stretch. You've been sitting so long, give at least two people a high five. So first of all, I want to thank the lead organizers, Cindy Choi, as well as the Buddha's Light International Association Young Adults Division, as well as Greening Sacred Spaces for making this interfaith youth forum possible. I have a story to tell. And it begins with ACT, an acronym. So what is a 10 minute commute is actually two hours because I live in Jerusalem and my university is in Palestine. These words painted a picture in my mind like no other. And I hope you realize that this is not my story, but a story of a friend of mine. I, I had encountered so many people from all around the world, but my world stopped at this one because I had never encountered somebody who had faced challenges pursuing education due to political tension. And it is because I came to Canada and my parents with only a high school uh, graduate diploma. Education was everything for my future. And so encountering this person, it sparked my awareness, which is A for ACT. And it reminds me of what John Vanier, who recently received the Templeton Prize in 2015, a Canadian, and he said, our world is evolving rapidly and is at a crisis point today. Either we move toward a deeper unity among all people in a spirit of openness, mutual respect, and fraternity, or the divisions that exist between us will turn into terrible forces of fear and hate. And I think when we see the news, it is very evident that fear must be changed into openness. So act. Awareness becomes commitment. So I'm happy to share on behalf of the Youth for United World 
an international initiative called the United World Project, which is being recognized globally by UNESCO Brazil and was presented in the Italian Parliament this past March, and is basically a platform of making a world of difference, literally, which includes an online petition of over 68,000 people who have committed to living by the golden rule. And Yusuf and many others, panelists, have mentioned about the golden rule. And I urge you to look at page thir three when it speaks about the green rule. Do unto the earth as you would have it done unto you. And we are part of creation, God's creation. And so after awareness and commitment, is the time to take action. And actually this week, the first week of May, is the United World Week, which is part of the United World Project. And it is to celebrate actions that the 68,000 people who have committed to live by the Golden Rule take. So if you picture an iceberg, what is visible is our collective actions for promoting peace. But how about the, in the bottom of that iceberg? the individual actions we take, inspired by whatever faith or tradition we come from. And so these actions are amplified around the world, and actually yesterday was the three main events that happened in India for the United World Week. First, there was a sports event that promoted peace, um, ex and wall painting that expressed the ideals of unity and peace, and then the third event was um, a music concert uniting international artists and, and artists from India. And so my commitment is also to share this interfaith forum in the United World Week. And I just want to share just the last example of the commitment um, we've taken in Toronto. So I have a few friends of the Youth for United World. Can you please raise your hand? Kevin, Gino, and Adam. And we have uh, gone to a shelter downtown, which is the Good Shepherd Center, and I know James had just shared about a touching story about the homeless in our community and how beyond just volunteering there is an opportunity to live by the golden rule. So together we can act. Awareness, commitment, and take action. Thank you. Thank you very much. So one thing I want to mention is that changing fear into openness, and I think that's a very powerful statement. And you also briefly mentioned the idea of collective action, and I. Hope, I encourage everyone to keep that in mind uh, for our next session after this uh, uh, after our next talker, speaker. And so now I would like to invite uh, Emily to uh, share some of her experiences. Thank you. Um, so I just want to reiterate the guiding questions that was given. So uh, the first one was, uh, how does your faith support a positive view about the future? And uh, in Judaism, um, the faith of faith, our faith is based on the idea that teaching future generations is uh, integral to our survival. And I think uh, that message has also been talked about across the face um, and then the fact that uh, the future is us, the youth. Um, the second question uh, was asking about roles that youth uh, can bring to, a to create a better future. And um, in my synagogue, uh, our roles actually begin at a very young age. We um, participate in uh, creating works of art that are displayed. Uh, we are given opportunities to be involved in services, whether that's through music or role play. Um, as, we are, as we grow, we are also encouraged to ask questions and to seek those answers um, out ourselves, and um, with a little bit of guidance along the way as well. Um, by the time we are 13, we are welcomed into the adult community as a bar bat mitzvah or a son or daughter of the commandment. And um, this is pretty uh, significant because we are considered to be uh, um, uh, an important part of what we call a minion, which is uh, Hebrew for account. And it's um, in order to recite uh, very important prayers. And we are not able to do so if we do not have that minimum of 10 people uh, who are of far above its age. So um, as you can see, 13 is a very significant age in, in our particular faith. And uh, um, when someone has become that bar mitzvah, uh, the role of them in the community actually changes. And uh, we are encouraged to take leadership prospects that include leading services, educating other young children, uh, creating opportunities for outreach programming like this, 
um, and tikkun olam, which is uh, mending of the world. So um, raising money for things like uh, the Salvation Army or the Food Bank of Mississauga or um, for homeless and women's shelters. Uh, we do gardening projects and the list of, of course goes on. Um, the essence of Jewish faith uh, lives in, or lies in uh, giving large responsibilities to the youth. So it's sort of like a passing the torch and we are um, expected to take it and kind of run with it. And um, I guess it is another reminder for the fact that the mending of the world has no age limit. Um, and also by starting young, we are actually able to help our community for a longer period of time. Um, including youth means building a strong foundation for a bright future. It means bridging the gap between all ages to create stronger relationships. It means incorporating new ideas, new ways of doing things, and extending our knowledge. It creates balance. <coughs> where the student becomes the teacher, and the teacher still remains a pupil. Our generation is well equipped to do, do this more so than anyone else before. And, it, and it's up to us to actually make this happen. It, the future is literally at our fin fingertips. So the next question um, was in regards to um, how our people's needs can be met. Uh, better in the future. So again, going back to the fact that the future is literally at our fingertips. We are a huge technological generation and we are capable of opening our minds so much more than um, to what the world has to offer to us. And that means that we are empowering ourselves to know more, do more, and become better for it. When we seek to extend our hands and include others, we are broadening all of our horizons all while enriching, enriching our own lives as well as the other people that we come across. In my uh, particular synagogue in the reform movement, we are known to be a little bit more liberalized and for instance, in our, uh, at my shul, we endorse families um, from all walks of life. So we have members who are openly gay, we have interracial couples, we have families with one parent who is Jewish and one is not, um, very, um, very blended families. And, and it's really um, humbling to see, and it's, it's a wonderful, uh, warm, and welcoming environment that um, I've literally grown up with my whole life, and I couldn't imagine it without. Um, and just to, um, in regards to the last guiding question, um, it's in regards to different religions and how we can actually all work together to build a more peaceful world. So as, as I stated before, we, us in this room right now have the power to change that. And since we are the future, um, it is in coming together as we are doing so in this moment right now, we have proved our commitment to one another in actually playing this greater role. And if we open our minds and our ears and, our, and we also open our hearts. I am a firm believer in loving thy neighbor and intend to keep this in continuing to do work with local interfaith programs such as this, and I know I'm going a little bit over my time, but I uh, just want to finish off with a, a really uh, wonderful quote by a wise man. One love, one heart. Let's get together and feel all right. <laughs> so let's please Bob Marley and make this a reality. All the best and good life and peace to you all. Cheers. Thank you very much. from alerting and then milestones and then taking a leadership role and uh, how it's kind of like a cyclic <coughs> process. And since we, this theme was talking about the future, uh, I, I have no, no doubt that all of our <coughs> community leaders are, are on that step in uh, taking leadership and passing on the, the light or the seed or what you might call it. So that's, this will conclude this, the, the speech section. So I will open up about five minutes for uh, any of our panelists that want to share a reflection on a comment that an earlier pa panelist has made. Uh, does anybody uh, want to share a reflection or a thought? Um, um, for uh, me, with James, um, the fact that writing really resonated with me as well. I also like to write. Um, I also write for <laughs> a healthy mind. Um, and I think that's powerful, the power of words. And whether they're spoken or written or sung or whatever, signed, um, the message is, is, is very clear and, and I really appreciate your words today.
Yes, sir. James? Um, just to build off what Emily just said, and to reflect on what uh, you said first said about um, raising civic awareness and the importance of education. Um, I believe, and it was, it, this is a theme that's been mentioned throughout, and it, I noticed it was in the first um, panel as well, uh, with what Rahime said about um, fully understanding issues and not just having a superficial understanding of them. You need to truly embody um, all the different knowledge so you're able to fully communicate them. And I believe that um, when you're able to, or when you finally truly understood um, the sort of social issues that plague the world today, um, not just with like homelessness, um, environmental degradation, but also with um, social issues that divide the different faiths, I believe that it is um, a faith person's responsibility to go and communicate that information. So not just to fully understand it, but also to express it and make change and make sure that um, you're not keeping this information to yourself and that whenever you see anybody that may not um, that kind of conflicts with what you believe in, you use your words to tell them and try to move them in the right direction. Thank you very much. Maybe you have one more comment that anyone want to share? You said? <coughs> Thank you very much, Vivian. Um, I just want to thank all the panelists for reconfirming my belief in interfaith dialogue because I've been here sitting and I've been listening to everybody's speeches and I keep hearing over and over again love, compassion, understanding, justice. So this is, this is telling me once again, it's reminding me that it is possible to reunite under certain values. So I would just like to say thank you for reminding me that it is possible to love all creation for the sake of the creator. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing those words. We'll open up maybe for one question uh, on the floor. Does anyone, or maybe San Francisco, <laughs> anyone have a question? Okay, perfect. So uh, this will conclude, officially conclude our panel session, and we'll move directly into our next session, which is basically one thing we want to, a uh, pilot project that we want to try to initiate for maybe our next conference, and this is the idea of the action plan. And so all the panelists, I believe, were contacted uh, by uh, Cindy, and the idea is we come here all together, we share our experiences. Can we all collectively uh, agree on doing one project, and then, Bring it back to your youth group, bring it back to your community members, share it with your leaders, and do something about it. And so um, we, we got some uh, feedback from five different uh, of our panelists, and I'm going to uh, invite them and maybe give maybe about a, a one minute uh, uh, introduction of your idea, and then collectively we're going to vote on it, and the idea is hopefully we'll choose one action and then we'll bring it forward. Okay, so uh, I'll just go in alphabetical order. So I'm going to first invite Emily, who wants to uh, talk briefly about Stand for Trees. Um, so Stand for Trees, um, it actually came about, uh, I was on Facebook, I um, was um, drawn to a link, a YouTube link from a, a conscious hip hop rapper called Prince E, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, essentially, uh, he writes a poetic piece on, I think, do we have the actual video? I think. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to show a little bit. It's a long video, but please, if you if we can't see the whole thing, um, please go online and take a look at it. But it's essentially talking about saying, "I'm sorry. I'm sorry to future generations um, for what we have done to this planet, um, and trying to turn that around." So, um, or sorry, Stanford Trees is an organization in which they help um, protect deforestation of forests around the world. Um, they also help plant trees, which is uh, something that we could definitely use more of considering our CO2 emissions are rising by the second. So um, hopefully uh, you like some of his poetic literature. And Dear future generations, I think I speak for the rest of us when I say sorry. Sorry we left you with our mess of a planet. Sorry that we were too caught up in our own doings to do something. Sorry we listen to people who made excuses to do nothing. I hope you forgive us. We just didn't realize how special the earth was. Like a marriage gone wrong, we didn't know what we had until it was gone. For example, I'm guessing you probably know it as the Amazon Desert, right? 
Well, believe it or not, it was once called the Amazon Rainforest, and there were billions of trees there, all of them gorgeous, and... Oh, you don't know much about trees, do you? Well, let me tell you, trees are amazing. I mean, we literally breathe the air they are creating. They clean up our pollution, our carbon. They store and purify water, give us medicine that cures our diseases, food that feeds us, which is why I'm so sorry to tell you that we burn them down, cut them down with brutal machines, horrific, at a rate of 40 football fields every minute. That's 50% of all the trees in the world gone in the last hundred years. Why? For this. And that wouldn't make me so sad if it weren't so many pictures of leaves on it. You know, when I was a child, I read how the Native Americans had such consideration for the planet that they felt responsible for how they left the land for the next seven generations. All right, thank you very much. We're just gonna pause that video. Again, I think it was Change for Trees, uh, the website. Stanford. Sorry, Stand for Trees. Sorry, the change is in my head, right? <laughs> Stand for Trees, I again encourage everyone to go and look at the complete video. Uh, simply due to time, I'm now invite Donata to sp uh, briefly speak about uh, the idea of going to uh, uh, shelters. So I had mentioned in, in my talk about the project that has been ongoing for the past year and a half. And it has been a, a big desire in my heart and dream that you know we can go volunteer together, but it goes beyond that, is to build relationships. So it's through this project that has been happening already for the past year and a half, and, and because I have built a relationship with people that are at the Good Shepherd Ministries, which is at Queen of Parliament, so a downtown shelter, that we could come together to volunteer for, usually we go for about four hours, and then afterwards we go to a coffee shop. And the idea after volunteering is that we can actually engage in dialogue, and the, the tool that I was thinking we could use is called Storytelling for Change. So we had mentioned a lot about using our stories and our, our narratives from different faith traditions and religions and how through sharing our stories we can recognize our humanity, recognize that we all come under one common factor. And so that's in essence the idea that we can volunteer at a shelter or a center, but it goes beyond that. It goes that we have the opportunity to build relationships through a tool called Storytelling for Change, which is an online course um, that can help us guide the discussion for using our stories as a way to make change. Perfect. Thank you very much for that. And our third suggestion will go, Joanna will introduce with regards to a greening, green agriculture. Okay, so um, our youth division has been recently doing some work with the idea of what is known as zero waste growing. So I know that um, a few of our youth members have attended, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe a conference with green tickets, or green Greening sacred spaces uh, regarding the ways of zero waste growing. So what this idea is, um, is growing with very low budget, um, something that is sustainable and doesn't cause a lot of harm to the environment. So we were hoping that this was something that feasible that we could bring back to a lot of the different youth groups and then maybe at the end of the year come together and share what we've grown. Excellent. And uh, Natasha? Thank you. Um, just a show of hands, who's bothered by the fact that there's 805 million people that don't have enough food to eat every day? Show of hands. Okay, awesome. Pretty much everybody. Uh, show of hands for those who actually want to do something about it. Yeah, most of us. <laughs> um, so, has anyone ever heard of 30 hour famine before? Oh, good, great. Okay, has anyone done 30 hour famine before? Oh, even better. All right, so 30 hour famine essentially is an opportunity for uh, you or a group, whether it's yourself as an individual or maybe a group of you from your school or uh, from your faith community, pretty much getting together for 30 hours and not eating. And essentially the, the reason behind that is because there are so many people in the world that don't get to eat every single day. And so what you're doing is by not eating, you're kind of standing in solidarity with them. Um, and in addition to that, kind of leading up to that day where you decide, okay, I'm not going to eat for 30 hours. You're actually talking to other people about these issues. 
And as you're talking with people about these issues, you actually ask them to take their financial resources, whether it's $5, $10, $20, some people $100, and actually donate to the cause. And so this year, what's really awesome about World Vision is that we're partnering with the World Food Program so that every single dollar that you donate actually gets tripled. And the money goes to places like Haiti, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, the Philippines, Nepal, for example. And you get an opportunity to then provide emergency food relief, education programming, and different things that really help to alleviate poverty. So the idea is perhaps we could all choose a date, or if you want, kind of do it on your own, and pretty much make an impact. And so the website that you can go to is famine.ca or yourmovement.ca to learn a little bit more about it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Natasha. And then our last, uh, we're going to invite Rahime to come up and share some of uh, her idea of uh, doing a s speech contest. Thank you. Um, I, I had a project when I was in high school, in grade 12. My teacher made, our teacher uh, made us write a um, speech about death. And I was thinking, I still have my speech still, um, in my email because I really think that death is a topic that we don't really discuss about. Like we're feared from it and we don't like to discuss about it at all. And I think it would be interesting to have a, a speech contest um, about your interpretation on death because it's something that any, um, it could be interpreted culturally and religiously different by many different people. So I was just thinking it would be nice to have a contest about the theme of death. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so to give you time, uh, we're just going to try to vote on the D survive. But basically, uh, what we're going to do now is uh, um, we'll, I'll just name up uh, uh, the different projects. And if you want to vote for this to be the action that you want to bring upon to your community, uh, just raise your hand. And my uh, my other partner, <laughs> Stephen, maybe if you can keep tally. I will. So uh, our first project is tree planting. So uh, if you guys feel like this is a passionate project that you want to bring forward collectively, please raise your hand. So we have one, two, yeah, so uh, three, two, one. Okay, I count as 16. 16? Yeah. Okay, perfect. And the second one is uh, uh, volunteering and shelters and the idea of storytelling through a change. Please place your hand up. Three, two, one. Are we allowed to vote for more than one? Let's say you vote once. <laughs> oh, um, okay. I thought uh, voting more for once actually would represent more. Should we do that? Okay, let's vote. Let's say the highest frequency will win. <laughs> vote as many times as you want. Okay. We can do all five. <laughs> so, did you guys want to start again? Yes. Let's start again. Okay. Who wants to plant trees? Everyone. Okay. So three, two, one. Okay, let's count hands. We have twenty-seven. Excellent. All right. So who wants to volunteer at shelters and use storytelling through change? Yeah, if you want to. Yeah. Twenty-seven as well. Twenty-seven as well. Okay. Are there people that are not voting? <laughs> yes, okay. they are. Zero waste growing. And if you're in the back, just come forward so Stephen can see you. Okay, count of fifteen. Okay. Uh, Thirty-hour famine. <laughs> I counted 27 again. 27, okay. And uh, uh, the last one is a, a speech competition on the interpretation of death through different faith, faith groups. Okay. Just uh, an addendum, our friends in San Francisco are actually voting as well. And oh, we're going to yeah. add them to our trial okay. votes to just try to drive the conversation. All right. I want to drive the decision forward. Are we able to do that right now? So they want six for tree planting. Okay. And none for the others. Did they want to vote? 
Not yet. They're still voting. Oh, they're still voting. <laughs> Three-hour difference. We will gradually add them in, I guess. So uh, in the meantime, since we're tallying, I believe there is a, a little slip in the middle of each form. And it says action form where you can put your contact information. I believe the main idea of that is uh, there's no way that we can really correspond with the different groups that are going with this action unless we have some sort of medium to communicate with. So if you are part of a group or know a group that might be interested, please need, leave some sort of contact information. Uh, our, the idea is if we know more information about if this is successful, we could use this collectively and bring it to other groups and say, oh, you know what? We have 10 different groups that are planting trees and we planted 5,000 trees within the last month, you know, year. <laughs> uh, see how much impact of community and coming together has, uh, in store, uh, has within us. So please leave some sort of information that we can use to contact. And uh, as for Cali, do we have some information on San Francisco? Or is uh, yeah, Malaysia? I'm looking at their chat right now. So is Malaysia still with us? Are we even sleeping now? They, they might be asleep by now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we had a six for the tree, and then there was another one that was one vote for trees and one for speech. And I think that's. I think that's. I think the one would be trees. The trees. The, the stand for trees. Okay, yeah. so uh, congratulations, everyone. So uh, I highly uh, uh, suggest everyone uh, to bring this motion forward to your community groups and to whatever organization you're part of. Uh, we're gonna try to promote change this year for uh, plant, planting more trees. That being said, David, I mean, um, it's with so many other compelling ideas yeah. and so much people that showed interest in it, Absolutely. I think that this should just be the end of those ideas. I think Absolutely. it should just be the beginning of those <laughs> yeah, ideas. Yeah, this is the beginning. You know, ideas not just from you know, different people, but also from different uh, and organizations. And if you wanted to add one note. Um, if this is what the project we're going to be doing, um, I highly recommend showing that video. It is about six minutes, but it is a um, very powerful message, and um, it'll help to kind of, uh, I guess, generate uh, what it is that we want to do. Um, and honestly, it's, it's, it's just great poetry, just listening to the way he speaks and the language and the words uh, that come out of his mouth, is, it's, it's very touching. Um, so I'm really excited. Thank you very much for that. Simply due to time, we might not be able to show the video. However, I think we could probably put the link on the website and also send uh, the email so everyone has access to that. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it back to our MC. Thank you, Fabian, our panelists, and all our participants again. Uh, I'm very excited to see how this project plan goes, and especially if we make this a once a year tradition. Um, each year could, could kind of be our checking point to see how we progress as a group. And a couple years down the line, look back and know that like, we were all here when this first action plan started between all our groups. So now we would like to uh, invite Renabo Melmu to present a certificate of appreciation to our speakers and to our panelists. Uh, on top of the certificates, we are also pleased to present our speakers with a book called 366, The Day of Wisdom. So uh, I'll call the speakers up one by one, and if you can come up, get, your, get the uh, certificate and the gift. Uh, so we'll start off with uh, our guest speaker today, Steve Lee. Alexander O'Neill. Caleb 
Rachel Rivet. Hector Ferrer. Yusuf Dagler. Natasha Armstrong. James Mangallon. Joanna Chu. Once again, to all our guest speakers, our facilitators, and all our panelists. Uh, this event is only successful because of all your meaningful insight and your discussions. And again, we hope you take this unique opportunity to uh, branch out to other youths in the community and add to your ongoing network. Uh, to wrap this up, we will invite uh, Mr. Fabian Yu, the president of BLIA Young Adult Division, the Toronto chapter, to give us a closing speech. going to keep it short because I know everyone is probably uh, waiting to read those books, right? <laughs> um, so uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for being able to come here. Thank you very much, uh, Cindy, as well as uh, for, uh, for greeting the Sacred Spaces uh, uh, for having uh, been able to work together on this uh, collaboration. And thank you to all the members to be able to come here uh, because it is all about dialogue. You know, we, when I come to temple, I really only know like, the Buddhist perspective of something. But today, I really learned a lot about all the different organizations, whether it's from a uh, Sikh perspective, an Islamic perspective, but also someone from, uh, from community groups. So thank you very much for that. If there's one, uh, I guess not a gospel, but a message I do want to uh, emit, it's that um, please emit change. Uh, we are the future, so Abbas has mentioned we're, we are going to be the future, uh, but in order for us to promote change, we have to have action. And I'm hoping, uh, you know, uh, I guess it's a bit of a, just uh, a metaphor to use the tree planting as an action of a collective goal. But if we can start with something simple, I like, like Lego and building blocks, you know, one step at a time, building that foundation, we can really emit change. So thank you very much for that, and thank you for all the participants. And last but not least, we would like to invite the President of Buddha's Light International Association, Toronto Chapter, Mr. Glenn Chang. Uh, President Fabian, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Glenn Chang, I'm the President of our Buddha's Light Group in here. I can remember back some time ago in the public school, I went to Catholic school, and then I went to the University of Ottawa and I met some Christian people, and I do make some friends from Muslim group. So I have friends among different religions. I remember one day we sit down and uh, say, there's so many wars, fightings against different religions and different culture, but we won't because we know each other. We are friends from Catholics, from Christian, from Muslim. We are friends, we know each other. But what happens someday, 
if people don't know, they start fighting or civil war, whatever, in Toronto, what can you do? You keep silent at that time because we don't know what to do. Because there's no platform for the people to understand the other reaches or the other efforts. But today, uh, I see the whole. So many people from different backgrounds, like Muslim, maybe Catholic, maybe some other religious world, some other ethics, okay? I think you have a respons responsibility for the future, just like what you say, future and hope. If one day things come out which is not so smooth, and you guys have to step up and say, I know people from different ethics, from different culture, from different religions. They're good people. We can stand together, build a candidate instead of fighting. So, today I can see the seed and today I can see your future. We can be together and build a better future. I always say, like, uh, in order to understand, there must be a communication. And then understand, and then the trust. And today I think we can start a dialogue, start a communication, knowing each other, and then we can trust each other. This is really important for your future, for your family, for your work. It related to everything. I can remember back in uh, two, three weeks ago. I, I came to Makam. I live in Makam. I'm so proud. Makam is one of the city that uh, we do a lot in recycle and, uh, and reuse. Actually, this is wrong. What's wrong? I learned from uh, three weeks ago, there's a forum in here saying that reduce is the most important. Not recycle, not reuse. Same as this happened in here. If you reduce the chance of having, fight, having war and fighting with different regions and different ethnic, and then you can build a better future. Instead of reuse or recycle, it's a reduce. Reduce the chance of having quarrel or fight with the other ethnic group or with the other religious group. It's the most important part. But all that is based on knowing each other. And today this forum, I think, is a very good stone and a build step for our future and for your future at the age of 55. Okay, not much ahead in me, maybe 20 years, but for you guys, a long way to go. And your future depends on yourself. Everything based on today. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn, and I would like to acknowledge our Malaysia youth and our San Francisco youth. They all gather around to say hi. I'm pretty sure they can see us. Uh, you can turn around your little needle uh, camera underneath the clock. I think they'll see you from there, if I'm not mistaken. Look at the camera on here. Thanks for having us. So we're going to take a big group photo now. Um, one of our staff, Wilson and Venerable, uh, will uh, guide us and help us take a good, nice picture for us for, uh, for memory's sake. So thank you again for coming, and uh, I hope you all have a great weekend.